Before we actually start the hearing, I'm going to give a point of personal privilege to a former chairman and my friend, Senator Leahy, to speak for a few seconds that he asked to do, and I think it's very appropriate that you do what you said you were going to do. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the courtesy. Uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee convenes for the first time in the 115th Congress. Historic moment in the committee's 200-year history. Last week, Senator Dianne Feinstein was named the committee's ranking member. The first time in American history that a woman has served in this capacity. And having been either chairman or ranking member for the past 20 years, I can't think of anybody better. It is striking that 352 members have served on the committee, and only five of those happen to be Democrats, have been women. Three of those five women are proudly serving on this important committee today. Senator Feinstein, Senator Klobuchar, and Senator Hirono. So after my, after these 20 years, I, I welcome uh, Senator Feinstein. We grapple with some of the most pressing issues facing our country. We Americans can be proud that she's here, and I applaud you for this. Thank you. Thank you, that's nice, thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Leahy. Good morning. I welcome everyone to this very important hearing to consider the nomination of our colleague, Senator Sessions, to serve as the 84th Attorney General of the United States. First, I want to set out a couple ground rules I want to handle this hearing the same way that I handled the hearing for Attorney General Lynch's nomination, and it's also the same way that Chairman Leahy handled previous hearings. I want everyone to be able to watch the hearing without obstruction. If people stand up and block the views of those behind them or speak out of turn, it's simply not fair is simply not considerate to others, so officers will immediately remove those individuals. Now, before my opening statement, let me explain how we will proceed. Senators Feinstein and I will give our opening remarks. Then Senators Shelby and Collins will introduce the nominee. Following Senator Sessions' opening remarks, We'll begin our first round of questions. Each senator will have an initial 10-minute rounds for questions. After the first round, we're going to do eight-minute rounds of questions. I want everyone to know that I'm prepared to stay here as long as members have questions that they'd like to ask. Again, that's the way I handled Attorney General Lynch's nomination. I think that's the most fair way to proceed for both members as well as our distinguished nominee. I welcome our new members to this committee. I look forward to working with all of the new members uh, as well as the ones that are repeating serving on this committee. I'd also like to recognize and welcome a number of important audience members, former Attorney General Meese and McKaysey, uh, and also our former colleague, Senator Kyle, a former member of this committee, and I see the Attorney General for uh, Ohio's here as well, a former colleague of ours. Finally, before my opening remarks, I congratulate Senator Feinstein on your appointment to uh, the, uh, and the decision to take over the ranking membership. We've always had a good working relationship. Uh, through several things we've done both legislatively and as leaders of the uh, Drug Caucus, and I appreciate very much the opportunity to work with you. Uh, thank you. Uh, with that, I'll now start my opening comments. Our hearing today hardly introduces Senator Sessions to the committee. No, we're here today to review the character and the qualifications of a colleague who has served alongside us in the Senate for 20 years. That includes his time as a ranking member of this committee. We know him well. 
We know the policy positions he's taken as a legislator. I've been on both sides of debates with this distinguished Senator Sessions. Having served with him for so long, we pretty well know whether he supports your policy positions or oppose them. He tells us so with his usual thoughtfulness, humility, and more importantly, respect. As a former chairman of this committee has put it, Senator Sessions is, quote, unquote, wonderful to work with. We know him to be, as, he, as another senior Democrat on this committee described him, quote, unquote, a man of his word. As a third senior colleague put it, a Democrat as well, he is always a gentleman. He is straightforward and fair. Most of all, the members of this committee know him to be a leader who has served the people of Alabama and all Americans with integrity, with dedication, and with courage. That describes how I know the nominee for the 20 years that I've served with him. As former Chairman Leahy observed the last time a new president took office, it's, quote, important that the Justice Department have a senior leadership in place without delay. We need the Justice Department to be at its best, end of quote. Perhaps my good friend Senator Schumer said it best when he observed that we should, quote, move to a vote, hopefully sooner rather than later, end of quote. And when we do, as he said, we, quote, won't be voting for or against the president's policies. We'll be voting, or in summary, Senator Schumer said, we'll be voting for a colleague with a first-rate legal mind whose record proves his commitment to just law enforcement and eminently qualified to lead the Department of Justice. I have been encouraged by the initial support many of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle have expressed for Senator Sessions' nomination. So I look forward to hearing from Senator Sessions and moving to his appointment without delay. Senator Sessions' record is a life of public service. And so we know his story. He was raised in a small town of Hybert, Alabama, where his father owned and ran a small country store. He then studied at Huntington College and the University of Alabama before practicing law in Russellville and Mobile. Senator Sessions has always been an active member of his community. He taught school before attending law school and taught Sunday school at Ashland Place Methodist Church. He served our nation in the Army Reserve, attaining the rank of captain. After his time in private practice, Senator Sessions served as an assistant U.S. Attorney General attorney in the Southern District of Alabama. He then headed that office after the Senate confirmed him for U.S. Attorney, a post he held for a dozen years. So all told, this senator, colleague of ours, has served 15 years as a federal prosecutor in the department that he will soon head. It was during that time that he oversaw the investigation of Klansman Francis Hayes for the brutal abduction and murder of a black teenager, Michael Donald. He made sure that case was brought to state court where the defendant was eligible for and received the punishment that he justly deserved, the death penalty. His office then successfully prosecuted that murder's accomplished in federal court. Based on his prosecutorial record, the people of Alabama elected him their attorney general and then their senator. He has served with us since 1997. And as our former chairman observed, this committee has relied on him for his prosecutorial experience during the course of his Senate service. Throughout his public service, both within the department and outside of the department, he has raised his hand and served when called upon. He has done his duty, enforced the law fairly, and let the chips fall where they may. Reflecting on this record of service, it's no surprise then 
that Senator Sessions was also an Eagle Scout. Other members of this committee know, as I do, that the Scout's model, be prepared, sits on his desk in his Senate office. Senator Sessions' entire life of dedicated public service has prepared him for this day. If he's confirmed, and I expect that he will be, Senator Sessions will shed his role as a legislator who writes law, and he'll take on the task of enforcing the laws Congress has written. He has made this transition before when the people of Alabama elected him their senator based on his record of service as U.S. Attorney and Alabama Attorney General. As one member of this committee observed about a lawyer's transition into the role of a judge, quote, there are turning points in a person's life when they put away things of the past and move into new responsibilities, end of quote. Serving as our nation's Attorney General will mark another such turning point in Senator Sessions' distinguished career. And every member of this committee knows from experience, in his new role, Senator Sessions will be a leader for law and order administered without regard to person. Leadership to that end is exactly what the department now needs. It should go without saying that the department is tasked with the responsibility of enforcing our laws, all of our laws, in a dispassionate and even-handed way. We write the laws. The executive enforces them faithfully. This is simple but very foundational principle. Unfortunately, for the last several years, the department has simply declined to enforce some laws the executive branch found obnoxious. The department's failure to enforce the law has run the gamut of issues from criminal law to our nation's duly enacted immigration laws. It's true that each branch of government has an independent duty to assess the constitution, uh, constitutionality of the laws it writes, it administers, and it adjudicates. But it's equally true that the executive has a constitutional responsibility to, as we all know, take care that the laws be faithfully executed. I know our colleague, this Senator Sessions, respects the legislative process and the prerogative of Congress to write the law. As he explained during the confirmation hearing that we held for John Ashcroft's nomination to serve as Attorney General, quote, the Attorney General is a law enforcer. There is a big difference between a politician and a senator where we vote on policy and, a, and executing that policy, end of quote. I look forward to hearing from Senator Sessions on how he will transition from voting on policy matters to enforcing the laws he has labored so long to improve and to sustain. Just as he respects Congress's duly enacted laws, Senator Sessions knows and respects the importance of an independent attorney general at the department's helm. When he has questioned other candidates for the office of attorney general, he has made plain the priorities of an attorney general's independence. He sought assurances on this account during the confirmation hearing for Attorney General Eric Holder, a nominee, a nominee that happens Senator Session and I both supported despite policy disagreements with Eric Holder. Senator Sessions asked at that time, quote, you are not threatening and not guaranteeing you are going to prosecute people until you fairly evaluate all the facts and the evidence and the law they thought they were dealing with at the time, end of quote. During this committee's hearing on the confirmation of another attorney general, Senator Sessions reflected on the obligations of the people as he knew them from his service in Alabama. Quote, you speak for the legal interests of the state, end of quote. As a result, he said, quoting again, there are times when the attorney general represents the state. He has an obligation and a duty, regardless of what the parties to a litigation may say, including when one of those parties is the government, to ensure that it is fair for all the people of the state. This firm grasp of the separation of powers 
equips this senator, Sessions, to provide the department with independent leadership of the highest priority. He knows the department's obligations well, not only because he knows the department, but because he has seen those obligations observed in the breach from his seat beside us in the Senate. To this legislator, the department's failure in the just enforcement of our laws isn't just a policy disappointment on a particular issue, it's an affront to the very separation of powers that defines our role and the voice of the people that warrants our votes. I imagine Senator Session may have thoughts on that question as well, and I hope to hear those points. On this committee, we don't always agree on the right way to handle the complex policy issues we consider. And when you have served in the Senate as long as Senator Sessions and I have, you're bound to find at least a few points of disagreement with even the most like-minded colleagues. But Senator Sessions, two decades of service beside me testify without question to this. He is a man of honor and integrity, dedicated to the faithful and fair enforcement of the law, who knows well and deeply respects the Department of Justice and its constitutional role. I look forward to hearing from him about this vision and plans for the department. And now it is Senator Feinstein's turn for her words. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to thank Senator Leahy also for his words. Uh, if I may, I would like to begin by just quickly introducing some Californians in the audience. Uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters from Los Angeles, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from the Bay Area, also Denise Rojas, who is a dreamer who has been enormously successful. I had the privilege of writing an article about her and also uh, the Reverend Dr. Amos Brown, whom I've known for 40 years, and the Reverend Dr. Frederick Haynes. They are part of the ministerial delegation here today. The senator before us this morning is someone that many of us on this committee has worked with for some 20 years, and that makes this very difficult for me. I committed to senator sessions in our private meeting and I'll say it again here. The process is going to be fair and thorough. But today, we're not being asked to evaluate him as a senator. We're being asked to evaluate him for the Attorney General of the United States, the chief law enforcement for the largest and best democracy in the world. As Attorney General, his job will not be to advocate for his beliefs Rather, the job of the Attorney General is to enforce federal law. Even if he voted against the law, even if he spoke against it before it passed, even if he disagrees with the precedent saying that the law is constitutional, most importantly, his job will be to enforce federal law equally, equally for all Americans. And this job requires service to the people and the law, not to the president. The president-elect said to his opponent during a debate, and I quote, if I win, I'm going to instruct my attorney general to get a special prosecutor to look at your situation, end quote. Mr. Chairman, that's not what an attorney general does. An attorney general does not investigate or prosecute at the direction of the president nor do attorneys generals wear two hats, one as the president's lawyer and one as the, president's pe as the people's lawyer. That model has failed. Rather, the attorney general must put aside loyalty to the president. He must ensure that the law and the Constitution come first and foremost, period. President Lincoln's attorney general, Edward Bates, I think said it best when he said this, and I quote, the office I hold is not properly political, but strictly legal. And it is my duty above all other ministers of state to uphold the law and to resist all encroachments from whatever quarter, end quote. Uh, that 
is the job of the Attorney General. If confirmed, Senator Sessions will be the top official charged with faithfully and impartially enforcing all federal law and protecting our fundamental right to vote from all incursions, whether they be foreign or domestic. His duty will be to enforce and protect our civil rights and constitutional freedoms, including a woman's right to choose. He will run the department that ensures those who commit hate crimes are held accountable. And he will be charged with protecting consumers and taxpayers from fraud and making sure that corrupt public officials are held accountable. He will prosecute polluters based on federal law. And it is the Attorney General who must ensure that this government follows the law, does not ever torture again. This is an awesome responsibility and an enormous job. What we must do now in these hearings is determine what type of Attorney General Senator Sessions will be if confirmed. And let me express a deep concern. There is so much fear in this country. I see it, I hear it, particularly in the African American community, from preachers, from politicians, from everyday Americans. As Mrs. Evelyn Turner of the Marion Three said in her passionate letter to this committee, and I quote, I am very troubled by his stance against civil rights in the more recent past. As a U.S. Senator, he supported no laws or causes which suggest that he has changed." End quote. Throughout his Senate career, Senator Sessions has advocated an extremely conservative agenda. For example, he voted no and spoke for nearly 30 minutes in this committee against a Leahy Amendment two years ago that expressed the sense of the Senate that the United States would not bar people from entering this country based on their religion. He voted against each of three bipartisan comprehensive immigration bills in 2006, 2007, and 2013. Twice, he voted against the DREAM Act, the bill for undocumented youth, known as dreamers, who were brought here as children through no choice of their own, calling it a, quote, reckless proposal for mass amnesty, end quote. He voted against efforts to prohibit the use of waterboarding and other so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, calling them lawful and praising Attorney General Mukasey in 2008 for refusing to rule out the use of waterboarding in the future. These interrogation techniques are and were, at the time, illegal. And thanks to a provision Senator McCain placed in the Defense Authorization Bill this past year, they are now prohibited from use. In addition, Senator Sessions voted against the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Act, which, among other things, expanded the hate crimes law to cover sexual orientation and gender identity. Arguing against the hate crimes law in 2009, he said this, today I'm not sure women or people with different sexual orientations face that kind of discrimination. I just don't see it, end quote. Well, this senator regretfully sees it. Hate crimes are happening. The Department of Justice must see it must investigate it and prosecute it appropriately. Those are votes that are deeply concerning. They are recent, they are important, and they clearly show this senator's point of view. Now, for all these reasons, this hearing must determine clearly whether this senator will enforce laws he voted against. We, the American people, want to know how he intends to use this awesome power of the Attorney General if he is confirmed. Will he use it fairly? Will he use it in a way that respects law and the Constitution? 
Will he use it in a way that eases tensions among our communities and our law enforcement officers? Will he be independent of the White House? Will he tell the President no when necessary and faithfully enforce ethic laws and constitutional restrictions? So we will ask questions and we will press for answers. Ultimately, we must determine whether Senator Sessions can be the Attorney General for all of our people. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to conclude with one final point. We cannot ignore that there are deep concerns and anxieties throughout America. There is a deep fear about what a Trump administration will bring in many places. And this is the context in which we must consider Senator Sessions' record and nomination to become the chief law enforcement of America. Communities across this country are concerned about whether they will be able to rely on the Department of Justice to protect their rights and freedoms. These freedoms are so cherished. They are what make us unique among nations. There have been sit-ins, protests, and writings, and the committee has received letters of opposition from 400 different civil rights organizations, 1,400 law professors, 1,000 law students, a broad task force of organizations that oppose domestic violence, 70 reproductive health organizations, and many, many others. All these letters express deep anxiety about the direction of this country and whether this nominee will enforce the law fairly, evenly, without personal bias. So I hope today's questions are probing and the answers are fulsome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the only way we have to know whether this man can dispatch himself from the president and from his record and vote in, f in full according to the laws of the United States of America. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, and Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Before I turn to Senator Shelby and Collins for their opening statement, I'd note that the committee received a letter from former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice indicating that she had hoped to join our colleagues in introducing Senator Stations. She strongly supports his nomination. It's a powerful letter, and I hope my colleagues will take time to read it, and I'd like to have it entered in the record at this point. Now to Senator Shelby and Senator Collins in that order. Proceed. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this historic hearing today. Although my friend and colleague Jeff Sessions is well known to the members of this committee, it's my distinct privilege to introduce him as President-elect Donald Trump's nominee to serve as our next United States Attorney General. Before joining the Senate, Jeff Sessions began his distinguished career as a practicing attorney and then served as the United States Attorney for Alabama's Southern District before ultimately becoming the Attorney General of the state of Alabama. During the past 20 years here in the U.S. Senate that I have served with Jeff Sessions, I've had the opportunity to know him well, not just as a skilled attorney with an accomplished record as a prosecutor and as a legislator, but as a man of extraordinary character. I have the highest regard, not only for his intellect, but for his integrity. Unfortunately, since the announcement of his nomination, Jeff's political opponents have attacked his character with baseless and tired allegations. But in reality, Jeff Sessions' extensive record of treating all Americans equally under the law is clear and well documented. Throughout his decades of public service, including his impressive tenure on this committee, Jeff's commi commitment to upholding the rule of law, I believe, is unparalleled. The integrity, humility, and gravity with which Jeff Sessions will approach the office of Attorney General of the United States is unquestionable. I have no doubt, Mr. Chairman, that he will apply the law with the impartiality that's required of the job. I'm also confident that this committee 
will report favorably and expeditiously Jeff Sessions' nomination to be the next Attorney General of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Senator Feinstein, members of this distinguished committee, I am pleased to join Senator Shelby in presenting my friend and colleague, Senator Jeff Sessions, and to offer my support for his nomination to be our next Attorney General. Jeff Sessions and I were first sworn into the United States Senate on the very same day. In the 20 years since, we have worked closely on some issues and on opposite sides on others. In fact, it would be fair to say that we have had our share of vigorous debates and policy disagreements. Through these experiences, I have come to know Senator Sessions professionally as a trusted colleague and personally as a good friend. I can vouch confidently for the fact that Jeff Sessions is a person of integrity, a principled leader, and a dedicated public servant. As a senator, Jeff Sessions has worked across the aisle to lead important legislative reforms. He has worked with Senator Dick Durbin to pass the Fair Sentencing Act, a law that addressed the unfair racial disparity in crack cocaine sentencing. He worked with Senator Ted Kennedy to pass the Prison Rape Elimination Act and with Senator Chris Coons on the reauthorization of the Victims of Child Abuse Act. An area where Senator Sessions and I have worked together is in opposing unfair trade agreements and practices that hurt American workers. What I want this committee and the American people to know is that Jeff Sessions is the same genuine fair-minded person in unguarded private moments as he is in the halls of the Senate. We first came to know each other during dinners with other members of our Senate class, where we discussed everything from our politics to our families. I have never witnessed anything to suggest that Senator Sessions is anyone other than a dedicated public servant and a decent man. In 1980, long before he ran for the Senate or even dreamed of being Attorney General, Jeff Sessions sponsored the first African-American member of the Mobile Lions Club. As U.S. Attorney, he provided leadership in the successful convictions of two Klan members who had murdered an African-American teenager. As ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee in 2009, he appointed the first African-American to serve as chief counsel to the Republican members. My friends, these are not the actions of an individual who is motivated by racial animus. In spite of this strong record, Senator Sessions' nomination has generated controversy. He has had to withstand some very painful attacks on his characters both years ago and again today, with little or no acknowledgement of his accomplishments and actions or the responses he has made to the accusations levied against him. As this committee debates this nomination, I would draw your attention to an important epilogue to Jeff Sessions' nomination 31 years ago to be a federal judge. The late Senator Arlen Specter of Pennsylvania was a member of the Judiciary Committee when the Sessions nomination was considered in, eight, in 1986. 
Senator Specter, then a Republican, voted against Jeff Sessions. Years later, in 2009, Senator Specter had switched parties. He was asked by a reporter if he regretted any of the more than 10,000 votes he had cast. Out of all of those votes, then Democratic Senator Specter cited just one. It was his vote against confirming Jeff Sessions as a federal judge. When asked why, Senator Specter replied, quote, because I have since found that Senator Sessions is egalitarian, end quote. In other words, once Senator Specter served with Jeff Sessions and had the opportunity to get to know him, he changed his mind. I hope that you will keep Arlen Specter's reflections in mind as this committee evaluates Senator Sessions' public service, his character, and his fidelity to the rule of law. The members of this committee have an advantage that Senator Specter did not. The vast majority of you have already served with Senator Sessions and you know him well. If this committee places its trust in him, I have every confidence that Jeff Sessions will execute the Office of Attorney General honestly, faithfully, and fully in the pursuit of justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Feinstein and members of this committee. And thank uh, both of our colleagues for your powerful statement. I appreciate it very much. Uh, and uh, you're free to go, and we'll call the nominee at this point. Senator Sessions, before you're seated, I'd like to administer the oath. Would you uh, raise your hand, please, and, re and answer this question? Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you, and please be seated. Uh, Senator Sessions, it's our uh, normal process if you desire to introduce uh, people that are with you, including your family. I'm sure you're very proud of. You're free to do that and then uh, go immediately to your opening statement. They're now stationed in the Pacific Coast. Uh, they have two children, Jane Ritchie and Jimbo, and they wish me well this morning. My daughter, Ruth Walk, uh, maybe Ruth, you would stand up, uh, and her husband, John Walk. John is an attorney with the Department of Homeland Security, and they have four children, as you see before you today, uh, Grace, Gracie, and Hannah, and Joanna, and Phoebe. Phoebe and Joanna are twins, uh, and we're so proud of them. My son Sam is a graduate of Auburn and Alabama Law School. Sorry, Sam, about the game last night. 
Lindsay, congratulations, wherever he is. Uh, Sam is an attorney in Birmingham, and he's married to Angela Stratus. They have four children, Alexa, Sophia, Lewis, and Nicholas. Ten grandchildren. The oldest is nine, and you can imagine the week we had at the beach this summer in Alabama. Finally, I want to express how humbled I am to have received such uh, overwhelming support and encouragement from our nation's law enforcement community. Many are here today. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to ask those present please to stand and be recognized, the law enforcement members that are here today. Would you please stand? Uh, every major law enforcement organization in America has in endorsed my candidacy. I feel the weight of the confidence they've placed in me. And gentlemen and ladies, I'll do my best to be worthy of that. And if I may, Mr. Chairman, yesterday was Law Enforcement Officer Appreciation Day. Sadly, on that day, we lost two of our brave officers. Orlando Police Department, Master Sergeant Deborah Clayton, one of the first officers to respond to the Orlando nightclub shooting in June, was shot and killed while confronting a subject wanted for murder. Sergeant Clayton, a 17-year veteran of the force, was married with two children. While assisting in the search for that assailant, Orange County Deputy First Class Sheriff Norman Lewis was killed in a traffic action on accident on his motorcycle. He was an 11-year veteran of the sheriff's office. These honorable and dedicated li uh, have dedicated their lives to keeping their community safe, and we should remember their service and keep them and our families and their families in our prayers. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, distinguished members of the committee. I'm honored to appear before you today. I thank you for the opportunity to respond to your questions as you discharge your duty in the appointment process as prescribed by the Constitution. I also want to thank my de dear friends. USA. No Trump, no KKK, no fascist USA. This is a racist, illegitimate, just like the whole Trump thing. This regime prevented from ruling. People can stand into the streets of free speech. January 14th. Let me stand up. January 14th and stay in the streets. Mr. Chairman, if I might, dear friends, uh, I want to thank uh, Richard Shelby, my colleague, and Senator Susan Collins for the kind and generous introductions. It was very moving and touching for me. It's hard to believe, really, that the three of us have served together in this body for almost 20 years. When I arrived in the Senate in 1997, I probably wouldn't have anticipated becoming so close with a colleague from Maine two people from the northernmost part of our country and the southernmost part of our country. It took us a while to perhaps understand our accents, but once we did, we became fast friends. Of course, Richard Shelby and I never had an accent problem. He was a has been a steadfast friend, and I think we've been a pretty good team representing the interest of Alabama and the United States. I want to thank President-elect Donald Trump for the confidence and trust he has shown in me by nominating me to serve as the Attorney General of the United States. I feel the weight of an honor greater than I aspire to. If I'm confirmed, I will commit to you and to the American people to be worthy of the office and the special tr trust that comes with it. So I come before you today as a colleague who's worked with you for years and some of you 20 years. You know who I am. You know what I believe in. You know that I'm a man of my word 
and can be trusted to do what I say I will do. You know that I revere the Constitution, that I'm committed to the rule of law, and you know that I believe in fairness and impartiality and equal justice under law. Over the years, you've heard me say many times that I love the Department of Justice. The Office of Attorney General of the United States is not a normal political office, and anyone who holds it must have total fidelity to the laws and the Constitution of the United States. He or she must be committed to following the law. He or she must be willing to tell the president or other top officials if no, if he or they overreach. He or she cannot be a mere rubber stamp. He or she must set the example for the employees of the department to do the right thing and ensure that when they do the right thing, they know the attorney general will back them up no matter what politician might call or what powerful special interest, influential contributor or friend might try to intervene. The message must be clear. Everyone is expected to do their duty. That is the way I was expected to perform as an assistant United States attorney. I'm working for Attorney General Meese and uh, part of my career. And that is the way uh, uh, I trained my assistants when I became United States Attorney. And if confirmed, that is the way I will lead the Department of Justice. In my over 14 years in the Department of Justice, I tried cases personally of every kind, drug uh, trafficking, very large international smuggling cases, many firearms cases, other violent crimes, a series of public corruption cases of quite significance, financial wrongdoing and environmental violations. Our office supported historic civil rights cases and major civil cases, protecting the people of this country from crime and especially from violent crime is a high calling of the men and women of the Department of Justice. Today, I'm afraid it's become more important than ever. Since the early 1980s, good policing and prosecutions over a period of years have been a strong force in reducing crime, making our communities safer. Drug use and murders are half what they were in 1980 when I became a United States attorney. So I'm very concerned that the recent jump in violent crime and murder rates are not anomalies, but the beginning of a dangerous trend that could reverse those hard-won gains that have made America a safer and more prosperous place. The latest FBI statistics show that all crime increased nearly 4% from 2014 to 2015, the largest increase since 1991, with murders increasing nearly 11%. Uh, the single largest increase since 1971. In 2016, there were 4,368 shooting victims in Chicago. In Baltimore, homicides reached the second highest per capita rate ever. The country is also in the throes of a heroin epidemic, with overdose deaths more than tripling between 2010 and 2014. Tripling. Nearly 50,000 people a year die from drug overdose. Meanwhile, illegal drugs flood across our southern, southern border and into every city and town in the country, bringing violence, addiction, and misery. We must not lose perspective when discussing these statistics. We must always remember that these crimes are being committed against real people, real victims. It's important that they are kept in the forefront of our minds in these conversations and to ensure that their rights are protected. So these trends cannot continue. It is a fundamental civil right to be safe in your home and your community. If I am confirmed, we will systematically prosecute criminals who use guns in committing crimes. As the United States Attorney, my office was a national leader in gun prosecutions nearly every year. We will partner with state and local law enforcement to take down these major drug trafficking cartels and dismantle criminal gangs. We will prosecute those who repeatedly violate our borders. It will be my priority to confront front these crimes vigorously, effectively, and immediately. Approximately 90% of all law enforcement officers are not federal, but they're state and local. They are the ones on the front lines they are better educated, trained, and equipped than ever before. 
They are the ones who we rely on to keep our neighborhoods and playgrounds and schools safe. But in the last several years, law enforcement as a whole has been unfairly maligned and blamed for the unacceptable actions of a few of their bad actors. They believe the political leadership in the country has abandoned them. They felt they have become targets. Morale has suffered. And last year, while under intense public criticism, the number of police officers killed in the line of duty increased by 10% over 2015. And firearms deaths of police officers are up 68%. So this is a wake-up call, colleagues. It cannot continue. If we're to be more effective in dealing with rising crime, we will have to rely and work with more effectively local law enforcement, asking them to lead the way. To do that, they must know they're supported. And if I am so fortunate as to be confirmed as Attorney General, they can be assured they will have my support in their lawful duties. As I discussed with many of you in our meeting prior to this hearing, the federal government has an important role to play in this area also. We must use the research and the expertise and the training that has been developed by the Department of Justice to help these agencies in developing the most effective and lawful law enforcement methods to reduce crime. We must reestablish and strengthen the partnership between federal and local officers to enhance a common and unified effort to reverse the rising crime trends. I did this as United States Attorney. I worked directly and continuously with local and state and law enforcement officials. If confirmed, this will be one of my priority objectives. There are also many things the department can do to assist the state and local officers to strengthen relationships with their own communities where policies like community-based policing have absolutely been proven to work. I am committed to this effort and to ensuring that the Department of Justice is a unifying force for improving relations between the police in this country and the communities they serve. This is particularly important in our minority communities. Make no mistake, positive relations and great communications between the people and their police are essential for any good police department. And when police fail in their duties, they must be held accountable. I have done these things as United States Attorney. I have worked to advance these kind of policies. In recent years, our law enforcement officers have been called upon to protect our country from the rising threat of terrorism that has reached our shores. If I'm confirmed protecting the American people from the scourge of radical Islamic terrorism, will continue to be a top priority. We will work diligently to respond to threats using all lawful means to keep our country safe. Partnerships will also be vital to achieving much more effective enforcement against cyber threats, and the Department of Justice clearly has a lead role to play in that essential effort. We must honestly assess our vulnerabilities and have a clear plan for defense as well as offense when it comes to cyber security. The Department of Justice must never falter in its obligation to protect the civil rights of every American, particularly those who are most vulnerable. A special priority for me in this regard will be the aggressive enforcement of laws to ensure access to the ballot for every eligible voter without hindrance or discrimination and to ensure the integrity of the electoral process, which has been a great heritage of the Department of Justice. Further, this government must improve its ability to protect the United States Treasury from fraud, waste, and abuse. This is a federal responsibility. We cannot afford to lose a single dollar to corruption and you can be sure if I'm confirmed, I will make it a high priority of the Department of Justice to root out and prosecute fraud in federal programs and to recover monies lost due to fraud and false claims, as well as contracting fraud and issues of that kind. The Justice Department must remain ever faithful to the Constitution's promise that our government is one of laws and not of men. It will be my unyielding commitment to you 
if confirmed, to see that the laws are enforced faithfully, effectively, and impartially. The Attorney General must hold everyone, no matter how powerful, accountable. No one is above the law, and no American will be beneath its protection. No powerful special interests will cower this department. I want to address personally the fabulous men and women that work in the Department of Justice. That includes, that includes personnel in Maine Justice here in Washington, but also the much larger number that faithfully fulfill their responsibilities every day throughout the nation. As a United States attorney, I work with them constantly. I know them in the culture of their agencies. The federal investigative agencies represent the finest collection of law enforcement officers in the world. I know their integrity and their professionalism, and I pledge to them a unity of effort that is unmatched. Together, we can and will reach the highest standards and the highest results. It would be the greatest honor for me to lead these fine public servants. To my colleagues, I appreciate the time each of you have taken to meet me one-on-one. -on -one. As senators, we don't always have enough opportunity to sit down and discuss matters face-to-face. -face. I had some great visits. I understand and respect the conviction that you bring uh, to your duties. Even though we may not always be in agreement, you have always been understanding and respectful of my positions and I of yours. In our meetings over the past weeks, you have had the opportunity to share with me uh, and your con uh, relating to the department from unprosecuted crimes on tribal lands, a matter that uh, is greater than I had understood, to the scourge of human trafficking and child exploitation, to concerns about cuts in grant programs, uh, to the protection of American civil liberties, uh, and the surge of heroin overdose deaths, to just name a few things. I learned a lot during those meetings, and particularly in my meeting with Senator Whitehouse, uh, who discussed uh, uh, cyber security. He has a great deal of knowledge there, and I'm glad that uh, Senator Whitehouse, you, and Senator Graham uh, have taken a lead on this important issue, and I think we can work together and make some progress, Senator Graham, and uh, congratulations on your football victory we'll last about night. That later. Pretty <laughs> little end. So I want to assure all of my colleagues that I have given your concerns earnest reflection and will bear them in mind as I move forward. I will sincerely endeavor to keep these lines of communications open and hope that we can continue our collegiality and friendships. In that regard, if, if, I'm to be, if I'm confirmed, I commit to all of you that the Department of Justice will be responsive, Mr. Chairman, uh, to Congress and will work with you on your priorities, all of you, and provide you with guidance and views where appropriate. The department will respect your constitutional duties, your oversight role, and the particularly critically important separation of powers between the executive and legislative branches. Let me address another issue straight on. I was accused in 1986 of failing to protect the voting rights of African Americans by presenting the Perry County case, the voter fraud case and of condemning civil rights advocates and organizations and even har harboring, amazingly, sympathies for the KKK. These are damnably false charges. The voter fraud case my office prosecuted was in response to pleas from African-American incumbent elected officials who claimed that the absentee ballot process uh, involved a situation in which ballots cast for them were stolen, altered, and cast for their opponents. The prosecution sought to protect the integrity of the ballot, not the block voting. It was a voting rights case. As to the KKK, I invited civil rights attorneys from Washington, D.C. to help us solve a very difficult investigation into the un unconscionable, horrendous death of a young African-American coming home from the 7-Eleven store at night simply because he was black, uh, his M Michael Donald, and actively backed the attorneys throughout the case, and they broke that case. That effort led to a guilty plea and a life sentence in court for one defendant and his testimony against the uh, other defendant. There was no federal death penalty at the time. I felt the de death penalty was a 
appropriate in this case, and I pushed to have it tried in state court, which was done. That defendant was indeed convicted and sentenced to death. And 10 years later, ironically, as Alabama's attorney general, my staff participated in the defense of that verdict and sentence. And a few months after I became United States uh, Senator, that murdering Klansman was indeed executed. So I abhor the Klan and what it represents and its hateful ideology. Uh, I insisted uh, uh, Marsh Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center and his lawsuit that led to the uh, successful uh, collapse of the Klan, at least in Alabama, the seizure of their building, at least for that period of time. As civil rights division attorneys have testified before the committee, I supported fully their historic cases that the Justice Department filed to advance civil rights and that I supported, including cases to desegregate schools, abolish at-large elections for cities, county commissions, and school boards. These at-large elections were mechanisms used to block African-American candidates from being able to be elected to boards and commissions. It was a deliberate and part of a systemic plan to reduce the ability of African Americans to have influence in the election and governing process. I never declared the NAACP was un-American or that a civil rights attorney was a disgrace to his race. There is nothing I am more proud of than my 14 years of service in the Department of Justice. I love and venerate that great institution. I hold dear its highest ideals. As God gives me the ability, I will work every day to be worthy of the demands of this august office. You can be absolutely sure that I understand the immense responsibility I would have. I am not naive. I know the threat that our rising crime and addiction rates pose to the health and safety of our country. I know the threat of terrorism. I deeply understand the history of civil rights in our country and the horrendous impact that relentless and systemic discrimination and the denial of voting rights has had on our African-American brothers and sisters. I have witnessed it. We must continue to move forward and never back. I understand the demands for justice and fairness made by our LGBT community. I will ensure that the statutes protecting their civil rights and their safety are fully enforced. I understand the lifelong scars borne by women who are victims of assault and abuse. And if I am so fortunate to be confirmed as your Attorney General, you can know that I understand the absolute necessity that all my actions must fall within the bounds of the Constitution and the laws of the United States. While all humans must recognize the limits of their abilities, and I certainly do, I am ready for this job. We will do it right. Your input will be valued. Local law enforcement will be our partners. Many friends in federal government that I've had in law enforcement will be respected. I've always loved the law. It is the very foundation of this country. It is the exceptional foundation of America. I have an abiding commitment to pursuing and achieving justice and a record of doing that. <clears throat> and if confirmed, I will give all my efforts to this goal. I only ask that you do your duty as God gives you the ability to see that duty as you are charged by the Constitution. Thank you for your courtesies. I look forward to the further hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I ask questions, I want to thank you, Senator Sessions, for your uh, service in the Senate, but more importantly, for taking on this responsibility you've been nominated for, and to thank you for your opening statement. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to mention the names of a lot of your family that are with you, and there's a lot of other people that we may not have their name, and I would ask the staff to put in the record the names of all the other the people, people who are accompanying you, you today, today as well, if they're willing to give us that name. And uh, it's, a, it's a proud day for you, your wife, son, and daughters, and their families. I welcome all of you very much. Now to the questioning. 
the Attorney General, uh, I'll take 10 minutes and Senator Feinstein will go back and forth as we usually do. The Attorney General of the United States is, of course, the nation's chief law enforcement officer. He or she is not the president's lawyer, nor is he the president's wingman, as Attorney General Holder described himself. Rather, he or she has an independent obligation to the Constitution and to the American people. Now, I know you care deeply about this foundational principle. So I'm going to ask uh, you a question. I've heard you ask other nominees for Attorney General. Occasionally, you'll be called upon to offer an opinion to the President who appoint, appointed you. You'll have to tell him yes or no. And sometimes Presidents don't like to be told no. So I'd like to know, will you be able to stand up and say no to the President of the United States if in your judgment the law and your duty demands it. And the reason I ask that is because I know you work very hard for the President-elect. Mr. Chairman, I understand the importance of your question. I understand the responsibility of the Attorney General, and I will do so. You simply have to help the President do things that he might desire in a lawful way and have to be able to say no, both for the country, for the legal system, and for the President to avoid situations that are not acceptable. I understand that duty. I've observed it through my years here, and I will uh, fulfill that responsibility. Now, say, just so my colleagues don't think I'm taking advantage of time, somebody, somebody didn't, didn't start. start the clock. Um, oh, it's your clock. Here's your clock. Oh, you got it. OK. It's just, well, it's, the light isn't working. I'm sorry. It, I can read it now. Uh, so, I heard what you said, but just to emphasize, let me follow up. Well, if you disagree with the President's chosen course of action, and you told him so, and he intends to pursue that course of action anyway, what are your options at that point? Mr. Chairman, I think a Attorney General should first work with the President. Hopefully that Attorney General would have the confidence of the President and avoid a situation that would be unacceptable. I do believe that if Attorney General is asked to do something that's plainly unlawful, uh, he cannot participate in that, he or she, and that person would have to resign ultimately before agreeing to execute a policy that the Attorney General believes would be uh, unlawful or unconstitutional. Uh, you, sir I would say, Mr. Chairman, that there are areas that are brightly clear and right there are areas that may be gray, and there are areas that are unacceptable. And a good attorney general needs to know where those lines are uh, to help the president where possible and to resist improper, unacceptable actions. Okay. Uh, you served in this department for uh, 14 or 15 years. You served as your state's attorney general. And of course, you serve on this committee for a long time. And we have oversight over the department that you might had, uh, and you've done that all for 20 years. I've had my share of disagreements with the department's leadership over the last few years. Some of those were purely policy disagreements, but some issues were especially troubling to me in that depart uh, in that the department failed to perform fundamental functions to enforce the law. As Attorney General, day in and day out, you'll be faced with difficult and sometimes thorny legal problems. What will your approach be to ensuring that the department enforces the law, and more broadly, what is your vision for the department? Mr. Chairman, uh, the ultimate responsibility of the de Attorney General and the Department of Justice is to execute the laws passed by this Congress and to follow the Constitution in that process and carry its principles out. So you can be sure I understand that. We may have had disagreements here about whether a law should be impassed, should be passed, but once passed, uh, I will do uh, my dead level best to ensure it's properly and fairly, <coughs> excuse me, enforced. I do believe that we have a, a crime problem. I won't perhaps go in time now unless you want me to, to describe uh, 
what we can do to address that. And there are other challenges this country faces. Uh, I would be pleased to recognize the influence of the legislative branch and to welcome uh, the insights that you might have. Since that's a very important issue with me and I suppose every colleague here, let me emphasize by saying, is it fair to say then that regardless of what your position may have been as a legislator, your approach as Attorney General will be to enforce the law regardless of policy differences? Absolutely, Mr. Ch Chairman. That's, uh, I don't think I have any hesitation or any lack of an ability to separate the roles uh, that uh, I have had, to go from the executive the legislative branch to the executive branch uh, is a transfer of uh, not only position, but of the way you approach issues. I would be an executive function, an enforcement function of the laws this great legislative body might pass. Uh, during the course of the presidential campaign, you made a number of statements about the investigation of former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton relating to her handling of sensitive emails and regarding certain actions of the Clinton Foundation. You weren't alone in that criticism. I was certainly critical in the same way as were millions of Americans on those matters. But now you've been nominated to serve as Attorney General. In light of those comments that you made, some have expressed concern about whether you can approach the Clinton matter impartially in both fact and appearance. How do you plan to address those concerns? Mr. Chairman, it was a um, highly uh, contentious campaign. I, like a lot of people, made comments about the issues in that campaign. With regard to Secretary Clinton and some of the comments I made, I do believe that that could place my objectivity in question. I've given that thought. I believe the proper thing for me to do would be to recuse myself from any questions involving those kind of investigations that um, involve uh, Secretary Clinton and that were raised during the campaign. I or think, could be otherwise connected to it. Okay. I think uh, that's, let me emphasize then with a follow-up question. Uh, to be very clear, you intend to recuse yourself from both the Clinton email investigation and any matters involving the Clinton Foundation, if there are any? Yes. Uh, let me follow up again, because it's important. When you say you'll recuse, you mean that you'll actually recuse, and the decision will therefore fall to, I assume, a deputy attorney general? I ask because after Attorney General Lynch met with President Clinton in Phoenix, she said she would, quote unquote, defer to the FBI, but she never officially recused. No, she did not officially recuse, and there's a procedure for that which I would follow. And I believe that would be the uh, best approach for the country because we can never have a political dispute turn into a criminal uh, dispute. Uh, that's not in, e in any way that would suggest anything other than absolute objectivity. This country does not pol punish its political enemies, but this country ensures that no one is above the law. You touched on something that's very dear to me, and that's working with having executive branch people work with members of the Congress. Uh, and you also mentioned working with us on oversight. But since that's very important to me, let me say that the executive branch has always been one of my top priorities, regardless of who occupies the White House. I've often said I'm an equal opportunity overseer. Now, over the years, I've asked quite a few executive nominees, both Republican and Democrat, to make commitments to respond to oversight. You said you would, but in my experience, nominees are usually pretty receptive to oversight requests during these type of hearings. But have, after they've been confirmed, oversight doesn't seem to be a high priority for them. As I told you when we met privately in my office, Sometimes I think nominees should go ahead and be a little more straightforward during their hearings. 
And instead of saying yes to everything we ask about oversight, it'd be more honest to say maybe when asked if they would respond to our questions. Uh, now, because you've served on this committee and understand the importance of oversight, I'm hoping you'll be different than your predecessors in response to oversight questions. And so I have with me that I'll give to one of your staff a whole bunch of letters that haven't been answered yet. One of them, even you signed with me to the Department of Justice. And I hope that you would uh, go to great lengths to see that these get answered. So the next May or June, if I'm contacting you that they haven't been answered, then uh, the, uh, you, the, you know, the Trump administration might be blamed for it. And these are all a result of not getting answers from the last administration. So I hope you'll help me get answers to these, at least the one you helped me write. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, you are correct that this committee has oversight, but it goes beyond that. This committee and the Congress uh, funds the various branches of the executive branch, the various departments. And you have every right before you fund our agencies and departments to get responsive answers to questions that are proper. Uh, sometimes department, the Congress has asked for issues that maybe there's legitimate reason uh, to object to, but they should object and state why. Mr. Chairman, I will uh, be responsive to your, your request, and I understand your history, perhaps more than anyone in this Congress, to ad advance the idea that uh, the executive branch uh, needs to be held accountable. And, and I Senator salute Fein you for it. And if Senator Feinstein contacts you, uh, don't use this excuse that so many people use, that if you aren't chairman of a committee, you don't have to answer the question. I want her questions answered just like you'd answer mine. I understand that. Senator Feinstein. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was above and beyond the call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to begin uh, with a it was the second largest criminal industry in this country, which is now, believe it or not, by revenues produced, human sex trafficking. And trafficking victims are among the most vulnerable in our society. The average age is 12 to 14. They are beaten, raped, abused, at times handcuffed at night so they can't escape, and often moved from place to place, forced to have sex with multiple men each night. The Justice for Victims of Trafficking Act, signed into law in 2015, created a domestic trafficking victims fund for victim services to be administered by the Department of Justice. Part of that fund contains up to 30 million for health care or medical items or services to trafficking victims. These funds are subject to the Hyde Amendment, which says no appropriate appropriated funding can be used to pay for abortion. However, the Hyde Amendment does not apply in cases of rape. On the Senate floor, Senator Cornyn discussed the Hyde language and said, and I quote, everyone knows the Hyde Amendment language contains an exception for rape and health of the mother. So under this act, these limitations on spending wouldn't have anything to do with the services available to help those victims of human trafficking. In short, Senator Cornyn asserted that the Hyde Amendment, which contains an exception for rape, would not affect the availability of services for these victims. The Domestic Trafficking Victims Fund will be under the jurisdiction of the Department of Justice. Here's the question. Will you ensure that these grant funds are not denied to service providers who will assist victims of human trafficking in obtaining comprehensive services they need, including abortion, if that is what is required for a young girl impregnated during this horrific abuse. Senator Feinstein, I appreciate that question, and I do appreciate the fact that our country uh, has been talking and, I believe, taking action 
for a number of years to deal with sex trafficking more effectively. I don't know that we've reached the level of actual effectiveness we need to, but Congress and you and others have been very, very outspoken about this, and there are all kinds of great citizens groups that have focused on it. So it's a very important issue. I was not aware of how the, how the language for this grant program has been established. I do appreciate your concerns on it. Uh, it's a matter that I have uh, not thought through, but uh, ultimately it's a matter for this United States Congress, not so much a matter for the Attorney General. We need to put our money out to assist in this activity according to the rules established by the Congress. Well, I'm delighted that Senator Cornyn is here. I quoted him directly from the floor that the Hyde Amendment would not prevent the distribution of these funds. And so I hope you would agree to that. And that's certainly most important to me because Congress has spoken and the bill is law. I understand that and uh, we would follow the law. Okay. As you know, the Constitution also protects a woman's right to have access to health care and determine whether to terminate her pregnancy in consultation with her family and her doctor. I'm old enough to remember what it was like before when I was a student at Stanford and thereafter. In the early 1960s, I actually sentenced women in California convicted of felony abortion to state prison for maximum sentences of up to 10 years, and they still went back to it because the need was so great. So was the morbidity, and so was the mortality. This right, passed now by the Constitution, as recognized in Roe, Planned Parenthood v. Casey, and the Supreme Court's recent decision in Whole Women's Health and Helterstead. In fact, the court recently struck down onerous regulations imposed by Texas on women's health clinics. You have referred to Roe v. Wade as, quote, one of the worst colossally erroneous Supreme Court decisions of all time, end quote. Is that still your view? It is. I believe it's a, it violated the Constitution and uh, really attempted to set policy and not follow law. Uh, it is the law of the land. It has been so established and settled for quite a long time, and it deserves respect, and I would respect it and follow it. On November 14, 2016, appear, appearing on the TV show 60 Minutes, the president-elect said that the issue of same-sex marriage was, quote, already settled. It's law. It was settled in the Supreme Court. It's done, and I'm fine with that. Do you agree that the issue of same-sex marriage is settled law? Supreme Court has ruled on that. Um, the dissents dissented vigorously, but it was five to four, and five justices on the Supreme Court, the majority of the court, has established the definition of marriage for the entire United States of America, and I will follow that decision. Now here's another question. If you believe same-sex marriage is settled law, but a woman's right to choose is not. What is the difference? Well, I haven't uh, said that uh, the woman's right to choose or the Roe versus Wade and its progeny is not the law of the land or not uh, clear today. Um, so I would follow that law. Thank you. I would like to ask uh, one question based on the letter that we received for 1,400 law professors. They're from 49 states. Only Alaska is left out. I inquired why, and they said because Alaska doesn't have a law school. <laughs> so it's a pretty comprehensive list representing law professors in every state that has a law school. Um, what they said, and this is what I want you to respond to, nothing in Senator Sessions' public life since 1986 has convinced us that he is a different man than the 39-year-old attorney who was deemed too racially insensitive to be a federal district court judge. <clears throat> Excuse me. All of us believe it's unacceptable for someone with Senator Sessions' record to lead the Department of Justice. So I want your response to this and answer to the question, how do you intend to put behind you 
what are strongly felt personal views take off the political hat and be an attorney general who fairly enforces the law and the Constitution for all. Well, Senator Feinstein, uh, I would direct their attention to first to the remarks of Senator Specter, who in his entire career said he made um, one vote that he would regret, and that was the vote against me. He indicated he thought I was an egalitarian, a person who treated people equally and respected people equally. This caricature of me in 1986 was not correct. I had become United States attorney. I supported, as the uh, civil rights attorney said, major civil rights cases in my district that integrated schools, that prosecuted the Klan, uh, that uh, uh, ended single member districts that denied uh, African Americans the right to hold office. I did everything I was required to do. And the complaints about the voter fraud case and the complaints about the Klan case that I vigorously uh, prosecuted and supported are false. And I do hope this hearing today will show that I conducted myself honorably and properly at that time and that I am the same person, uh, perhaps wiser and maybe a little better, I hope so, today than I was then. But I did not harbor the kind of animosities and race based discrimination ideas that were um, I was accused of. I did not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Senator uh, Hatch and then Senator Leahy. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Before your time starts, uh, yeah, sure. I, I'd like to mention that the committee received a letter in support of Senator Sessions' nomination. Uh, from Attorneys General Ashcroft, Barr, Gonzalez, Meese, and McKaysey, uh, as well as a number of former Deputy Attorney Generals. They wrote in part as follows a, a sentence uh, from that letter. Based on our collective and extensive experience, we also know him to be a person on wavering dedication to the mission of the Department to assure that our country is uh, governed by a fair and even-handed rule of law. I ask consent to put that letter in the record. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I first want to thank you for your fair approach to this, our first hearing on, of the uh, 115th Congress. You've scheduled and you've structured this hearing in, in line with this committee's precedents. In fact, you are including more witnesses in this hearing than uh, the past average for Attorney General nominees. Senator Sessions has provided this committee with more than 150,000 pages of material relevant to his nomination. That is 100 times uh, what Attorney General Lynch provost and almost 30 times what Attorney General Holder provided. This material comes from someone we know, someone many of us have served with in the Senate and on this very committee. Yet some on the far left will stop at nothing to defeat this nomination. They oppose this nomination precisely because Senator Session will not politicize the Justice Department or use its resources to further a political agenda. They make up one thing after another to create a caricature that bears no resemblance to the nominee who is actually before us here today. Now, I've been on this committee for a long time, and I've seen these dirty tactics used before. And they're not going to work this time. Senator Sessions, it sounds a little strange to say this, but welcome to the Senate. Thank you. <laughs> the Senate Judiciary Committee. I'm sure there will be some need to uh, address false claims and fabricated charges during this hearing. Believe it or not, however, I actually have some questions about issues and policies that uh, you will be addressing when you become Attorney General. The first is one I have uh, raised with every incoming Attorney General nominee for nearly uh, uh, 25 years, and it concerns enforcement of federal laws prohibiting obscenity. In the 108th Congress, you introduced Senate Concurrent Resolution 77, expressing the sense of the Congress that federal obscenity laws should be vigorously enforced throughout the United States. It pleased the Senate, or excuse me, it passed the Senate unanimously, it pleased it too. In fact, it is the only resolution on this subject ever passed by either the Senate or the House. Now, Senator Sessions, with your permission, I want to share with you 
that resolution adopted last year by the Utah legislature outlining why pornography should be viewed as a public health problem, as well as some of the latest research into the, uh, into the uh, harms of uh, obscenity. Is it still your view that federal laws prohibiting adult obscenity should be vigorously enhanced? Mr. Chairman, those laws are clear and they are being prosecuted today and should be continued to be effectively and, and vigorously prosecuted in the cases that are appropriate. In making this a, a priority for the Justice Department, would you consider reestablishing a specific unit dedicated to prosecuting this category of crime? So that unit has been disbanded. I'm not sure I knew that, but I, it was a part of the Department of Justice for a long time, and I would consider that. Okay. For several years now, Senator Chris Coons and Representative Tom Marino and Susan Delben and I have raised the importance of safeguarding data privacy on an international scale uh, from unauthorized government access. Now, that is why we continue to push forward the International Communications Privacy Act, which establishes a legal standard for accessing extraterritorial communications. The need for a legislative solution was reinforced in July when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second uh, Circuit held in Microsoft v. United States that current law does not authorize uh, U.S. law enforcement officials to access electronic communications stored outside the United States. If confirmed, will you and your staff work with us to strike the needed balance to strengthen privacy and, and promote trust in the United States uh, technologies worldwide while enabling law enforcement to fulfill its important public safety uh, mission. That would be a high responsibility, Senator. I know you've worked hard on that for a number of years, as have others, members of this committee, Senator Coons and others. So working that out, understanding the new technology, but the great principles of the right to privacy, uh, the ability of uh, uh, individuals to protect data that they believe is private and should be protected. All of those are great issues in this new technological world we're in, and I would be pleased to work with you on that. And I do not have firm and fast opinions uh, on the subject. Well, thank you so much. Now, I'd like to turn now to rapid DNA, a technology that will allow law enforcement officials to speedily process DNA samples in 90 minutes or less. FBI Director Comey told this committee that rapid DNA would help law enforcement, quote, change the world in a very, very exciting way, unquote. Legislating, legislation authorizing law enforcement to use this technology, which you co-sponsored, passed the Senate last year. I was disappointed, however, that it got tied up with criminal justice reform efforts in the House. Now, I have two questions. First, do you, do you agree with, Director, uh, with FBI Director Comey and with law enforcement leaders across the country that rapid DNA legislation is important and will help law enforcement to do their jobs better and faster? And secondly, do you agree with me that we should work to pass this legislation sooner rather than later and should avoid tying it to efforts uh, on other legislative issues whose path forward is unclear? Mr. Chairman, rapid DNA uh, analysis could, could, is a huge uh, important issue for the, the whole American criminal justice system. It presents tremendous opportunities to solve crimes in an effective way uh, and uh, can be uh, produce justice because it uh, is a kind of thing that you can't fake or mislead. So I am very strongly in favor of that. And my personal view after many years in the law enforcement community is that one of the biggest bottlenecks, colleagues, of all of our laws involving uh, prosecutions of criminal activity is the bottleneck of the uh, scientific analysis, the forensic sciences, where we fail sometimes to get DNA back, fail to get back fingerprint analysis, fail to get back uh, drug analysis, yeah. chemical analysis, and all of this slows down and stops cases that should long since have been brought forward and disposed of. Okay. I've read that some Democratic senators accuse you of opposing the Violence Against Women's Act. Uh, uh, that caught my attention because, like I did, you actually voted to reauthorize it. 
As I recall, in 2013, there were not one but two bills to reauthorize VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act. One had controversial provisions that had never been received in a hearing, the other did not. Am I right that you supported reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act? Absolutely. I, I supported it in 2000 when it passed. I supported it in 2005 when the bill, I, on both of those bills I supported became law. And then in this cycle, Senator Grassley had a bill uh, that I thought was preferable, uh, and I supported his bill that actually had tougher penalties than the other bill. And it is kind of frustrating to be accused of opposing uh, VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, when I have voted for it in the past. There was some specific add-on provision in the bill that caused uh, my concern and I think other people's concern. And yeah, Mr. Chairman, I ask consent to place in the record an op-ed published in USA Today on this subject by Penny Nance, president, president of Concerned Women uh, for America, the nation's largest public policy women's organization, if you can. Without objection, it will be included. Now, I have a question about the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. The division enforces the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which protects the right of prison inmates to worship and protects churches and religious institutions from burdensome zoning and other restrictions. Uh, so I introduced this legislation in 2000. It passed without objection in both the Senate and the House. I would note for the record that next Monday, January 16th, is Religious Freedom Day. I hope that you will make the religious freedom of all Americans a priority under your leadership. The Civil Rights Division also has a unit dedicated to combating human trafficking. It was created in 2007, and one of my former Judiciary Committee counsels, Grace Chun Becker, was its first uh, head. Perhaps you could com comment on the significance of issues such as religious freedom and human trafficking and why it's important to include them within the civil rights agenda of the department. Mr. Chairman, religious freedom is a great heritage of uh, America. We respect people's religion. Uh, we uh, encourage them to express themselves and to develop their relationships with the higher power as they choose. Uh, we respect that. It's mandated in the Constitution. But there are situations in, in which uh, I believe we can reach accommodations that would allow the religious beliefs of persons to be uh, honored in some fashion, as opposed to uh, just dictating everything uh, under a single provision or policy. So I believe you're correct. Uh, we should recognize uh, religious free freedom. It will be a very high priority of mine. Well, that means a lot <clears throat> to me. Now, Mr. Chairman, let me close by asking consent to place in the record letters from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. They attest to Senator Sessions' work on behalf of the vulnerable children and young people. And I also ask consent to place in the record a letter supporting uh, this nomination from nearly two dozen men and women who have served as Assistant Attorneys General in 10 different offices and divisions. They say that as both U.S. Senator and U.S. Attorney, quote, Senator Sessions has demonstrated a commitment to the rule of law and to the even-handed administration of justice. I could not agree more. Without objection, Thank you. Uh, those will be included. Uh, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome Senator Sessions and Mrs. Sessions. Uh, let me just follow up. You were just asked about Violence Against Women Act and your, your support. Let's deal with the facts. Let's deal with what was actually voted on. Let's deal with the Violence Against Women Act that you voted against. You strongly oppose the uh, Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013. Spoke against it, uh, you voted against it. That law expanded protections for some of the most vulnerable groups of domestic violence and sexual assault survivors, students, immigrants, LGBTQ victims, and those on tribal lands. Now, the Justice Department, by all accounts, has done an excellent job implementing and enforcing it over the last three years. I believe, and we were both prosecutors, I went to a lot of domestic violence scenes. 
crime scenes as a young prosecutor. I believe that all victims of domestic and sexual violence deserve protection. Why did you vote against expanding protections for LGBT uh, victims, students, immigrants, and tribal victims of domestic violence and sexual assault? Why did you vote no? Mr. Chairman, I did indeed support the bill in 2000 and in 2000. I'm talking about the bill that is the law today. I understand what you The law today is passed in 2013 by an overwhelming margin in the Senate and by an overwhelming margin in the Republican-controlled House signed into law by President Obama. I'm asking about that. Why did you oppose it? Mr. Chairman, a number of people opposed the, some of the provisions in that bill, not the entire bill. I'm just asking about you. I'm trying to answer. Go ahead. Uh, so when we voted in the committee, uh, eight of the nine Republicans voted against the bill. One of the more concerning provisions was a provision that gave uh, tribal courts uh, jurisdiction to try persons who were not um, uh, tribal members. That's contrary, I believe, the only time that's ever happened. That was the big concern that I raised, I believe, primarily uh, um, on, on the legislation. So I voted uh, with uh, the, uh, com the chairman and the legislation he had that I thought did the job for protecting women to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act, but at the same time did not uh, have other things attached to it that I, call, I thought were concerning. Well, on the um, uh, tribal courts, those have now been prosecuted uh, very carefully. Defendants receive due process rights. They have to. Uh, none of the non-Indian defendants who have been prosecuted have appeal to federal courts. Many feel it's made victims on tribal land safer. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you agree with the way the Justice Department has handled such cases? Mr. Chairman, I do believe that the law has been passed by Congress. I'm interested to see how it plays out in the real world. Uh, and I will do my best to make my judgment about how to enforce that as Attorney General. Well, uh, certainly the, the law itself has many powerful provisions that I'm glad was passed and that is in law and provides uh, protections to women as victims against uh, victims well, of violence. On the tribal lands, it's been used and prosecuted for three years. Do you feel it's been handled correctly? Mr. Chairman, I have no understanding of that, but in uh, of the results of it so far, I'm interested, first time I've heard it commented on, let me say this to you directly. In meeting with senators prior to this hearing, I've had quite a number, perhaps more than any other issue, that I learned a lot about. And that is that non-Indians that have been going on to tribal lands and committing crimes, including rape, have not been effectively prosecuted. Now, under current law and historically, they would have been prosecuted in the federal government by the United States attorneys. And that has not been happening sufficiently, I am now convinced. So I do think the, the FBI, particularly maybe the Bureau of Indian Affairs investigators, should be beefed up, and the U.S. attorneys uh, need to do probably a Before, better job of prosecuting cases that need to be prosecuted in federal court. Those, those were facts that came out pretty clearly in the hearings before you voted against that provision. That is why Senator Crapo and I and others included in the bill. But let me, um, <clears throat> there may be, there have not been any tests to that. Nobody's, uh, nobody's appealed this, nobody's objected to it. But would you be able to, if, if somebody does, would you be able to defend it in court? I would defend the statute uh, if it's reasonably defensible. Yes, it's passed by Congress. It would be the duty of the Attorney General uh, whether they voted for it or support it, to defend it. And now, did I call you Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, a while ago? I think I did, so. Well, that's okay. You've been I, my chairman many years. Listen, so, I, I spent uh, 20, 20 years back and forth on this. I'm delighted to turn it over to uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Grassley, but. Um, well, you'll be handling all the money of the United States, I understand, in your new position. 
I'll, I'll, uh, <laughs> the, um, in 2009, I offered the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Hate Crimes Prevention Act as an amendment to the defense bill. It extended hate crimes protections to LGBT individuals, women, and individuals with disabilities. It passed the Senate overwhelmingly. You opposed it. You stated at a hearing that you're not sure women or people of different sexual orientations face that kind of discrimination. And then you said, I just don't see it. Do you still believe that women and LGBT individuals do not face the kind of discrimination that the hate crimes legislation was passed to prevent? Mr. Chairman, Senator Leahy, uh, having discussed that issue uh, at some length, uh, it, I, that does not sound like something I said or intended to say. What I did well, you, intend... You did say it. Well, I understand, but I've seen things taken out of context um, and not give an accurate uh, picture. My view is and was a concern that it appeared that these cases were being prosecuted effectively in state courts where they would normally be expected to be prosecuted. I asked Attorney General Holder to list cases that he had that indicated they were not being properly uh, prosecuted. I noted that Mr. Byrd was given the death penalty in Texas for his offense and um, Mr. Shepard, there were two life sentences imposed as a result of uh, the situation in his state. So the question simply was, do we have a problem that requires an expansion of federal law into an area that the federal government has not been uh, historically involved? Senator Hatch had a uh, uh, proposal that we do a study to see the extent of the problem and that we should have uh, evidence that uh, recognize, year, that indicates a shortage of prosecutions and a lack of well, willingness as far, as to prosecute study, before adding this law. As far as the study, last year the FBI said that LGBT individuals were more likely to be targeted for hate crimes than any other minority group in the country. I mean, we can study this forever, but that's a pretty strong uh, fact. Well, I will tell you, uh, Senator. And, and in 2010, you stated expanding hate crime protections to LGBT individuals was unwarranted, possibly unconstitutional. You said the bill has been said to cheapen the civil rights movement, especially considering what the FBI has found. Do you still feel that way? Mr. Chairman, the law has been passed. The Congress has spoken. You can be sure I will enforce it. Thank you. Um, when you were, well, let me, I don't want to go as much over, over time as, uh, as Senator Hatch did, but I'll ask you uh, uh, one question. The, uh, the president-elect has repeatedly asserted his intention to institute a ban on Muslim immigrants to the United States. In December 2015, you voted against a resolution that I offered in this committee that expressed the sense of the Senate that the United States must not bar uh, individuals from entering into the United States based on their religion. All Democrats, most Republicans, including the chairman, voted in support of my resolution. Do you agree with the president-elect that the United States can or should deny entry to members of a particular rigid religion based on their religion? I mean, we do background checks for terrorism, but based on their religion, do you believe, do you agree with the president-elect the United States can or should deny entry to all members of a particular religion? Senator Leahy, um, I believe the president-elect has subsequent to that statement made clear that he believes the focus should be on um, individuals coming from countries that have uh, history of terrorism, and he's also indicated that his policy and what he suggests is a strong vetting of people from those countries before they're admitted to the United States. Then why did you vote against the uh, resolution? Mr. Uh, I almost called you Mr. Chairman again. Uh, Senator Leahy, the, uh, 
my view and concern was in the resolution, it was suggesting that you could not seriously uh, consider a person's uh, religious views even and often sometimes, at least not in a majority, but in many people do have religious views that are inimical to the public safety of the United States. I did not want to have a resolution uh, that suggested that that could not be a factor in the vetting process before someone is admitted. But I have no belief and do not support the idea that Muslims as a religious group should be uh, denied admission to the United States. We have great Muslim citizens who've contributed in so many different ways. And America, as I said in my remarks at the occasion that we discussed it in committee, are great believers in religious uh, freedom and the right of people to exercise their religious beliefs. Before I turn I to... The consent to put some items in the paper. Uh, uh, yes, so without objection, your uh, inserts will be included. Uh, I have a letter from Solicitor General Ted Olson in support of Senator Sessions, quoting in part, with respect to civil rights, he says, quote, as a lawyer who has devoted years of effort to litigating and vind vindicating the civil rights of our fellow gay, lesbian, and transgender citizens, I recognize that people of good faith can disagree on legal issues. Such honest disagreement should not qualify disqualify them from holding public office. In particular, I have no reservations about Senator Sessions' ability to handle these issues fairly in accordance with law and to protect the civil rights of these and all of our citizens. I'd like to include that in the record without objection. Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, we're about to get an answer to the age-old question, can you be confirmed, Attorney General of the United States, over the objection of 1,400 law professors. <laughs> I don't know what the betting line in Vegas is, but <laughs> I like your chances. Uh, speaking of football, <laughs> I want to congratulate the University of Alabama for one heck of a streak. One of the most dominant football teams uh, in the history of college football. And I want to acknowledge the Clemson Tigers, where I live five miles from the stadium, that that was the finest college football game I think I've ever seen. Yeah. Davo Sweeney and the Tigers represent everything good about college athletics. And while we were on different teams early this morning, I want to let the good people of Alabama know that in terms of their Senator Jeff Sessions, he is a fine man, an outstanding fellow, who I often disagree with, I've traveled the world with, I've got to know him and his family, and I will enthusiastically support you for the next Attorney General of the United States. Now, let's talk about issues. Some people believe that the only way you can get justice in this world is for the federal government to administer it. Have you heard such thoughts? Well, I have. Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think I do too. I think the whole point is for the federal government to take over an area of law, there should be a good reason. Do you agree with that? Yes. If a state's not prosecuting crimes against people based on their sex, their race, whatever reason, <clears throat> then it's proper for the federal government to come in and provide justice. Do you agree with that? I do. When the state's doing its job, the federal government should let the states do their job. That is correct. That's, That's the general the principle, and uh, there's not a, a general cr federal crime, uh, federal statute that uh, federalizes all crime in America. To the people who are listening, that's just the way we think. You may not agree with that, but we think that way. And I think we've really got a good reason to think that way. I think that's the way they set up the whole system. Muslims. Uh, as you know, me and the president-elect have had our differences. <laughs> uh, about religious tests. Would you support a law that says you can't come to America because you're a Muslim? No. Would you support a law that says that if you're a Muslim, you say you're a Muslim, and when we ask you, what does that mean to you? Well, that means I gotta kill everybody that's different from me. It's okay to say they can't come. I think that would be a prudent decision. I hope we can keep people out of the country who wanna kill everybody because of their religion. 
I hope we're smart enough to know that's not what most people in the Muslim faith believe. So, but it, it can be the religion of that person. That's right. That's the point we're trying to make here. Uh, about the WIRE Act, what's your view of the uh, uh, Obama administration's interpretation of the WIRE Act to allow, to allow uh, online video poker or poker gambling? Uh, Senator Graham, I was shocked uh, at the memorandum, I guess the enforcement memorandum that the Department of Justice issued uh, with regard to the WIRE Act and criticized it. Apparently there is some justification or argument that can be made to support the Department of Justice's position, but I did oppose it when it happened, and uh, it seemed to me to be an unusual. Would you revisit it? I, will, I would re revisit it, or, and I would uh, make a decision about it based on careful study, uh, rather than, and I haven't reached, gone that far uh, to give you an opinion today. Immigration. You've said that the uh, executive order of President Obama, you believe, is unconstitutional, the DACA law. Do you still have that position? I did, um, for a number of reasons. But no, I'm not, I mean, right. I agree with you. <laughs> now, we've got 800,000 people that have come out of the shadows that have been signed up. <clears throat> Will you advise the next president, President Trump, to uh, repeal that executive order? Uh, there will be a decision that needs to be studied and that he would need to uh, agree to, but uh, it's an executive order, really a memorandum of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, it would certainly be constitutional, I believe, to re 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 repeal it. Re end that order. And I would, the Department of Justice, I think, could have no objection to a decision to uh, abandon that order because it, it is very questionable, in my opinion, constitutionally. Once we repeal it, and I agree that I believe it is an overreach, what do we do with the 800,000 kids who've come out of the shadows? Senator Graham, fundamentally, we need to fix this immigration system. Colleagues, it's not been working right. We've entered more and more millions of people illegally into the country. Each one of them produces some sort of humanitarian concern but it is particularly true for children. So we've been placed in a bad situation. I really would urge us all to work together. I would try to be supportive would you uh, to end the illegality and put us in a position where we can wrestle with how to handle these difficult, compassionate decisions. Right. And the best way to do it is for Congress and the administration to work together and pass a law, not an executive order. Exactly. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the law of war, do you believe that people who join al-Qaeda or affiliated groups are subject to being captured or killed under the law of war? I do, Senator. Um, they're just, I don't see how we could see it otherwise. Okay. Um, and it's the responsibility of the military to protect the United States from people who attack us. Do you believe the threats to the homeland are growing or lessening? I believe they are growing, and we're seeing that um, now in Europe, and we're also seeing it right here in America. Do you support the continuation of Gitmo as a confinement facility for foreign terrorists? Senator Graham, I think it's uh, designed for that purpose. It fits that purpose marvelously well. It's a safe place to keep prisoners. We've invested a lot of money in that, and I believe uh, it, could be, it should be utilized uh, in that fashion and have opposed the closing of it. Um, but as Attorney General, I just wanted to see if they were still listening. I think they're on the fence about Gitmo, but I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you, I, I support this administration's effort to make sure we prosecute terrorism as a uh, military action. 
not a law enforcement action. They're not trying to steal our cars or rob your bank account. They're trying to destroy our way of life, and I hope you will go after them uh, without apology, apply the law, and the law is the law of war, not domestic criminal law, and you'll have a friend in Senator Graham if you intend to do that. Uh, cyber attacks. Do you think the Russians were behind hacking into our election? I have done no research into that. I know just what the media says about it. Do you think you could get briefed anytime soon? Well, I'll need to. I think you do, too. You like the FBI? Do I like them? Yeah. Some of my best friends are do FBI you, Do you generally trust them? Yes. Are you aware of the fact that the FBI has concluded that it was the Russian intelligence services who hacked into the DNC and Podesta's emails? I do understand that. From your point or of view. Or at least that's what's been reported. And I've your, not been briefed by them right. uh, on the subject. From your point of view, there's no reason for us to be suspicious of them. Of their decision? Yeah. Bryce, I'm sure it was honorably uh, reached. How do you feel about a foreign entity trying to interfere in our election? I'm not saying they changed the outcome, but it's pretty clear to me they did. How do you feel about it? What should we do? Uh, Senator Graham, I think it's a significant event. Uh, we have penetration apparently throughout our government by foreign entities. We know the Chinese have revealed millions of uh, background information on millions of people in the United States. And these, I suppose, ultimately are part of international big power politics. But it, when a nation uh, uses their improperly gained or intelligence-wise gained information uh, to take policy positions that impact another nation's uh, uh, democracy or their uh, approach to any issue, then that raises real serious matters. It's uh, really, I suppose, goes in many ways to the State Department, how our Defense Department, and how we as a nation have to re react to that, which would include um, uh, developing some protocols where when people breach our systems that a price is paid, even if we can't prove the exact person who did it. I, I agree. I've got 20 seconds left. I've known you for, I guess, 15 years now, and we've had a lot of contests on the floor, and sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't. I'm from South Carolina, so I know what it's like sometimes to be accused of being a conservative from the South. That means something other than you're a conservative from the South. In your case, people have fairly promptly tried to label you as a racist or a bigot or whatever you want to say. How does that make you feel? And this is your chance to say something to those people. Well, it does not feel good. If nothing else, I'm clearing the room for you. <laughs> uh, and I would suggest that the freedom of speech also has some courtesy to listen. So what's your answer? Senator Graham, I appreciate the question. Uh, you have a, a southern name. You come from South Alabama. That sounds worse to some people. South Alabama. Uh, you, and uh, when I came up as a United States attorney, I had no real support group. I didn't prepare myself well in 1986, and there was an organized effort to caricature me as something that wasn't true. And it was very painful. I didn't know how to respond and didn't respond very well. I hope my tenure in this body has shown you that the caricature that was created of me was not accurate. Uh, it wasn't accurate then, and it's not accurate now. And uh, I just want you to know that as a Southerner who actually saw discrimination and uh, have no doubt it existed in a systematic and uh, powerful and negative way uh, to the people, great millions of people in the South, particularly of our country, I know that was wrong. I know we need to do better. We can never go back. 
I am totally committed to maintaining the freedom and equality that this country has to provide to every citizen, and I've, uh, I will assure you that that's how I will approach it. Senator Durbin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Sessions, um, let me first uh, say it's, um, I'm glad that you are, uh, brought your family with you today. It's a beautiful family with your wife and uh, your son and daughters and those four beautiful little granddaughters. And you kept them as quiet as you could for <laughs> as long as you could. So thank you so much for being here today. I'm sure it was great moral support um, and, and part of your effort here today. When you came by my office last week, I talked to you about a man named Alton Mills. And with the permission of the chair, I'd like to, he's my guest today, I asked Mr. Mills if he'd please stand up. Alton, thank you for being here today. I'd like to tell you a story so you can understand my question a little better. When Alton Mills was 22 years old, unemployed, he made a bad decision. He started selling crack cocaine on the streets of Chicago. He was arrested twice for possession of small amounts of crack cocaine. The third time that he was arrested, the kingpins who had employed him turned on him, and as a consequence, he ended up being prosecuted under the three strikes and you're out law. At the age of 22, pardon me, at age of 24, he was sentenced to life without parole. He had never been in prison before, and as I mentioned, there were no allegations made against him other than possession and sale, no violence, no guns, nothing of that nature. Alton Mills ended up, despite the sentencing judge's um, admonition that he believed this was fundamentally unfair and his hands were tied, Alton Mills ended up spending 22 years in federal prison until December 2015 when President Obama commuted his sentence. He was finally able to go home to his family. Senator Sessions, seven years ago, you and I co-sponsored a bill known as the Fair Sentencing Act, which Senator Collins referenced earlier, and that reduced the brutal sentencing disparity for crack cocaine crimes over powder cocaine. It was originally 100 to 1. We agreed in the Senate gym, I might add, to bring that down to 18 to 1. Inmates, overwhelmingly African American, were spared thousands of prison years because of our joint effort to end this injustice. Yet when I asked you to join me in appealing to the Sentence Commission, Sentencing Commission to follow our law, and when I asked you to join Senator Grassley and me in permitting the almost 5,000 still serving under this unfair 100 to 1 standard to petition individually for leniency, you refused. And you said of President Obama's pardoning of people like Alton Mills, and I quote, President Obama continues to abuse executive power in an unprecedented, reckless manner to systematically release high-level drug traffickers and firearms felons. So-called low-level nonviolent offenders simply do not exist in the federal system, you said. Senator Sessions, Alton Mills, and many more just like him do exist. So if you refuse to even acknowledge the fundamental injustice of many of our sentencing laws, why should you be entrusted with the most important criminal prosecution office in America? Senator Durbin, I think that's um, rather unfair related, based on our relationship and how we work together. In 2001, I introduced legislation very similar to the bill that you and I successfully made law. It would have reduced it to from 20 to 1, our bill went to 18 to 1, a little better, but, but fundamentally that. I was criticized by the Bush Department of Justice. My legislation was opposed by them. It was seven years later or, or so, or really longer, before our bill ever passed. So I was, stepped out against the, my own Republican administration and said openly on the floor of the Senate that I believe these crack cocaine uh, laws were too harsh with, and particularly, it was ad, a disadvantageous to the African-American community where most of the punishments were falling. And it was not fair, and we ought to fix it. So I just want to say, I took a strong stand on that, and uh, I did not agree, you and I did not agree on the retroactivity because a lot of these were plea bargain cases, 
and uh, may not have been totally driven by the uh, mandatory minimums. But uh, so I thought the court had basically now agreed that it is retroactive. I don't know what group uh, is not being covered by it, but a large group was covered by a court decision. We sort of left it open, as I remember. We did. And you and I discussed Let it. Let me say, in the, in the, on the issue of fairness, I will acknowledge you stepped out on this issue. And you and I both recognize the brutal injustice of 100 to 1. And we agreed on 18 to 1. That's how laws are made. And now we have 5,000 prisoners sitting in federal prison, still there under this brutal, unjust 100 to 1. And all I've asked, and all Senator Grassley's asked, allow them as individuals to petition to the judge, to the prosecutor, to the Department of Justice, so that their sentences could be considered. Well, that, that's something you've opposed. So in fairness, tell me why you still oppose that. Well, first, I will tell you um, with absolute certainty that if uh, this is a, a decision of this body, it's not the attorney general's decision about when and where a mandatory minimum uh, is imposed and whether it can be retroactively altered. So I will follow any law that uh, you passed, number one. Number two, I understood the uh, sincere belief you had on that issue, and it was a difficult call, and that's why we really never worked it out. So I understand what you're saying, uh, uh, but I did believe uh, that you are upsetting finality in the justice system, that you are uh, suggesting that the, these kind of factors were not uh, considered when the plea bargaining went down. So it's an honorable debate to have, and I respect your position on it. Senator, you have been outspoken on another issue, and I would like to address it if I could. I have invited here today Sergeant Oscar Vasquez, if he would be kind enough to stand up and be recognized. Sergeant, thank you for being here. I'll tell you his incredible story in <clears throat> short form. Brought to the United States as a child, in high school, he and three other dreamers started a robotics club and won a college-level robotics competition. They made a movie out of his story. He graduated from Arizona State University with an engineering degree. The Obama administration granted him a waiver and allowed him to become a citizen and enlist in the United States Army, where he served in combat in Afghanistan. Senator Sessions, since joining the Senate in 1997, you'd voted against every immigration bill that included a path to citizenship for the undocumented. You described the DREAM Act, which I introduced 15 years ago, to spare children who are undocumented through no fault of their own as, quote, a reckless proposal for mass amnesty. You opposed the bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform bill, which passed the Senate four years ago. You've objected to immigrants volunteering to serve in our armed forces, saying, quote, in terms of who's going most likely to be a spy, somebody from Coleman, Alabama, or somebody from Kenya? When I asked what you would do to address the almost 800,000 dreamers like Oscar Vasquez, who would be subject to deportation if President Obama's executive order was repealed, you said, quote, I believe in following the law. There is too much focus on people who are here illegally and not enough on the law. Senator Sessions, there's not a spot of evidence in your public career to suggest that as Attorney General, you would use the authority of that office to resolve the challenges of our broken immigration system in a fair and humane manner. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, you are wrong, Senator Durbin. I'm going to follow the laws passed by Congress. Uh, as a matter of policy, we disagreed on some of those issues. I do believe that if you can continually go through a cycle of amnesty, that you undermine the um, respect for the law and encourage more illegal immigration into America. I believe the American people spoke clearly in this election. I believe they agreed with my basic view, and I think it's a good view, a decent view, a solid legal view for the United States of America that we create a lawful system of immigration that allows people to apply to this country, and if they're accepted, they get in. If they're not accepted, they don't get in, and I believe that's right and just, and it, the American people are right to ask for it. We Senator, have not delivered that for them. Senator Graham asked this question, and I listened to your answer. When he asked you what would happen to those 800,000 currently protected by President Obama's executive order known as DACA, 
who cannot be deported for two years, it's renewable, and can work for two years, and you said, let Congress pass a comprehensive immigration reform bill. You opposed the only bipartisan effort that we've had on the Senate floor in modern memory. And what's going to happen to those 800,000 if you revoke that order and they are subject to deportation tomorrow? What is going to happen to them? What is the humane legal answer to that? Well, the first thing I would say is that my response to Senator Graham dealt with whose responsibility this is. I had a responsibility as a member of this body to express my view and vote as I believed was correct on dealing with issues of immigration. Uh, that's not the Attorney General's role. The Attorney General's role is to enforce the law. And as you know, Senator Durbin, uh, we're not able financially or any other way to uh, seek out and remove everybody that's in the country illegally. President Trump has indicated that criminal aliens, like President Obama indicated, certainly are the top group of people. And uh, so I would think that the best thing for us to do, and I would urge colleagues that we understand this, let's fix this system. And then we can work together uh, to in after this lawlessness has been uh, ended, and then we can ask the American people and enter into a dialogue about how to compassionately treat people who've been here a long time. That does not answer the question about 800,000 who would be left in the lurch, whose lives would be ruined while you're waiting on Congress for a bill that you opposed. Well, I thought it did answer it pretty closely to what you ask, and I understand your concerns. Senator Corner. Senator Sessions, congratulations to you and your family on this uh, once-in-a-lifetime honor to serve as the head of the Department of Justice. You know, sitting here listening to the questions and some of the comments that have been made both by the protesters and others, it strikes me that uh, many people have been surprised to learn more about your record, uh, your outstanding record as a prosecutor, or somebody who treated that responsibility to uphold and enforce the law and the Constitution without fear or favor. I think some people here listening today have been somewhat surprised uh, by your record in complete context. Those of us who've served with you in the Senate, some as many as 20 years, like Senator Shelby and Senator Collins, testified to your character. But I like to think that those of us who serve with you most closely in the Senate, particularly here on the Judiciary Committee, know more about you than just your record and your character. We know your heart. We know what kind of person you are. You're a good and decent and honorable man. You've got an outstanding record that you should be proud of, and I know you are, and you should be. For example, when somebody says that you unfairly prosecuted some African Americans for um, voter fraud in Alabama, it strikes me as incomplete, is the most charitable thing I can say, when they leave out the fact that the very complainants in that case were also African Americans. In other words, the people you prosecuted were African Americans, but the people whose voting rights you were trying to vindicate were African Americans. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Does that strike you as a fair characterization of your approach toward enforcing the law, that people would leave that important factor out? It's not, Senator Cornyn, and it's been out there for a long time. If you ask people who casually follow the news, they probably saw it otherwise. These were good people who had tried. They asked me to get involved in this case in 2002, a majority African-American grand jury with African-American foreman asked the federal government to investigate the 1982 election. Uh, I declined. I, I hoped that that investigation would have stopped the problem. But uh, two years later, the same thing was happening again. We had African-American uh, incumbent officials pleading with us to take some action. Uh, we approached the Department of Justice in Washington, the vote, uh, Public Integrity Voting Section. They approved uh, an investigation, and it developed into a legitimate case uh, involving uh, 
uh, charges of, of vote fraud, taking absentee ballots from voters, uh, opening them up and changing their vote and casting them for somebody they did not intend the vote to be cast for. It was a voting rights case. And uh, I just feel like we tried to conduct ourselves in the, in the right way. I never got in the uh, argument of race or other matters. I just tried to defend myself as best I could. I would note, colleagues, in just in the last few days, the son of uh, Albert Turner has written a letter and said I was just doing my job, and he understood the reason and the justification for the uh, prosecution and that I would be a good attorney general. So I was, that was gratifying to me, and that's the real truth of the matter. Senator Sessions, I know the nature of these confirmation hearings is that people pick out issues that they're concerned about or where there may be some good faith disagreement on policy, and that's what they focus on. But let me just ask you, maybe it's not a great analogy, but let me try anyway. You've been married to your wife, Mary, almost 50 years, right? Well, it hadn't gotten to 50 yet, 47. 47, be 48. okay. Well, that's a good run. <laughs> Let me just ask. Let it continue. Are, are there, I've been blessed. Are there occasions when you and uh, your wife disagree? No, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> You're under oath. Wait a minute. I'm under oath. Uh, on occasion, we do, yes. Well, do you think it would be fair to characterize the nature of your relationship with your wife based upon those handful <laughs> of disagreements that you've had with her over, over time? That's a good point. Thank you for making it. Uh, no, I don't. Well, and to your original point, your wife is always right. Correct. That is correct. You are under oath. <laughs> well, so this is the nature of this, these confirmation hearings. People are identifying uh, specific issues where there are policy differences. But my point is that does not characterize your entire record of 20 years in the United States Senate or how you've conducted yourself as a prosecutor uh, representing uh, the United States government in our Article Three courts. Let me get to a specific issue, a couple in the time I have remaining. I was really, really pleased to hear you say in your opening statement that many in law enforcement feel that our political leaders have on occasion abandoned them. You said police ought to be held accountable. But do you believe that it is ever, under any circumstances, appropriate for somebody to assault a police officer, for example? There's virtually no um, uh, defense for that kind of action. And I do believe that we are failing to appreciate uh, um, police officers who place their lives at risk, uh, as uh, this uh, sergeant in, was just killed yesterday trying to uh, deal with a violent criminal and vindicate the law, and she was killed. Um, that is the kind of thing that too often happens. We need to be sure that when we criticize law officers, it is uh, narrowly focused on the right basis for criticism. And to smear whole departments places those uh, officers at greater risk. And we are seeing an increase in a murder of police officers. It's up 10% last year. So I, I just could say, I could feel, I could feel in my bones the, how it was going to play out in the real world when we had what I thought oftentimes was legitimate criticism of a perhaps wrongdoing by an officer, but spilling over to a condemnation of our entire police force. And morale has been affected. And it's impacted uh, the crime rates in Baltimore and crime rates in Chicago. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Um, I, I regret that's happening. I think it can be restored, but we need to understand the requirement that, that the police work with the community and be respectful of their community, but we as a nation need to respect our law officers too. Well, I, for one, appreciate your, your comments because we ought to hold our police and law enforcement officers up in the high regard to which they deserve based on their service to the communities. And your comments remind me to some extent of Chief uh, David Brown's comments, the Dallas police chief following the tragic killing of five Dallas police officers recently, where he said that police ought to be held accountable, but under no circumstances could any assault 
against a police officer be justified based on what somebody else did somewhere at some time. So I, for one, appreciate that very much. You mentioned Baltimore and Chicago, and we've seen an, an incredible number of people, frequently in minority communities, who've been killed as result, results of crimes related to felons who perhaps are in possession of guns that they have no legal right to be in possession of. Uh, earlier, you talked about prosecuting gun crimes, and I'm glad to hear you say that. Uh, Project Exile, which originated, I think, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, which targeted felons and other people who cannot legally own or possess firearms, was enormously effective. And when I look at the record of the last five and ten years at the Justice Department, prosecution of those kinds of crimes down 15.5 percent in the last five years, down 34.8 percent in the last ten years. Can you assure us that you will make prosecuting those people who cannot legally possess or use firearms a priority again in the Department of Justice and help break the back of this uh, crime wave that's affecting so many people in our local communities like Chicago or, or Baltimore and particularly minority communities? I can, Senator Cornyn. Uh, I'm familiar with how that plays out in the real world. My best judgment, colleagues, is that properly enforced, the federal gun laws can reduce crime and violence in our cities and communities. It was highlighted in Richmond and Project Exile, but I have to tell you, I've always believed that. When I was United States Attorney in the 80s and into the early 90s, uh, we had a, we produced a newsletter that went out to all local law enforcement called Project Trigger Lock and went to federal law enforcement too, and it highlighted the uh, progress that was being made by prosecuting criminals who use guns to carry out their crimes. Criminals are most likely the kind of person that will shoot somebody when they go about their business. And if those people are not carrying guns because they believe they might go to federal court, be sent to a federal jail for five years, perhaps, they'll stop carrying those guns during their drug dealing and their other activities that are criminal. Fewer people get killed. Fewer people get killed. So I truly believe that we need to step that up. It's a compassionate thing. Uh, if one of these uh, individuals carrying a gun shoots somebody, not only is there a victim, they, they end up with hammering and uh, sentence in jail for interminable periods. The, the culture, the communities are safer with fewer guns in the hands of criminals. Thank you. Um, before we uh, go to Senator Whitehouse, uh, People have asked, uh, members have asked me about our break. Uh, and if it's okay with Senator Sessions, uh, it, it would work out about one o'clock if we have three on this side and three on this side for the one hour because it's noon right now. Is that okay with you, Senator Sessions? Mr. Chairman, I'm in, yeah. at your disposal. And so this will give my colleagues an opportunity that want to go to the respective uh, political party caucuses to go. Uh, and we would uh, take a recess of about uh, 30 to 40 minutes. That's very fair. Okay. Thank, uh, thank you, Senator. So then now, Senator Whitehouse. <clears throat> Senator Sessions, hello. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. When we met, I told you that I was going to ask you a particular question, so I'm going to lead off with that All particular right. question. Following the Gonzalez scandals at the Department of Justice, the Department adopted procedures governing communications between the White House and the Department of Justice, consistent with constraints that were outlined years ago in correspondence between Senator Hatch and the Reno Justice Department, limiting contacts between a very small number of officials at the White House and a very small number of officials at the Department of Justice. Will you honor and maintain those procedures at the Department of Justice? I will, Senator White House. You, as a uh, honorable and effective United States Attorney yourself know how that works and why it's important. Uh, Attorney General McKaysey uh, issued a firm and very clear, clear about supporting that policy. Probably, yes. Maybe still pending. And I would say to you, I, well, that's the appropriate way to do it. Uh, I read the, after you and I talked, I read the Reno Memorandum, the Gorelick Memorandum, and I think uh, I would maintain the those rules. 
on the subject of honorable prosecutions, when is it appropriate for a prosecutor to disclose derogatory investigative information about a subject who was not charged? That's a very dangerous thing. Uh, and it's a pretty broad question as you've asked it, but you need to be very careful about that. And there are certain rules, uh, like grand jury rules, that are very significant. And isn't it also true that it is customary practice because of the concern about the improper release of derogatory investigative information that the department customarily limits its factual assertions even after an individual has been charged to the facts that were charged in the information or the indictment? I believe that's correct, yes. That's a standard operating policy in most offices. Uh, there may be some exceptions, but I think that's standard operating procedure in the United States Attorney's Office is yeah. like you and I had. As a uh, question of law, does waterboarding constitute torture? Well, there was a dispute about that when we had the torture definition in our law. Uh, the Department of Justice memorandum uh, concluded it did not necessarily prohibit that, but Congress has taken an action now that makes it absolutely improper and illegal uh, to use waterboarding or any other form of torture uh, in the United States by our military and by all our other departments and agencies. Consistent with the wishes of the United States military. They have been supportive of that. And in fact, I just take a moment to defend the military. The military you don't need never to defend conducted. them from me. I'm all for I know, our military. But I just, most, so many people I b truly believe think that the military conducted waterboarding. They never conducted any waterboarding. That was by intelligence agencies. Their rules were maintained. I used to teach uh, the Geneva Conventions and the rules of warfare as an Army reservist to my personnel, and the military did not do that. And General Petraeus sent a military-wide letter disavowing the value of, of torture, as we, as we both know. Another question, uh, another question as a matter of law. Is fraudulent speech protected by the First Amendment? Well, fraudulent speech, if it amounts to an attempt to obtain a thing of value for the person, the fraudulent speech is directed. Which is an element of fraud. Absolutely fraud and can be prosecuted. And, and I think we see too much of that. We see these phone calls at night to elderly people. We see mail, uh, mailings go out that seem to me to be awfully far from truth and seducing people to probably make unwise decisions. So fraudulent corporate speech would also not be protected by the First Amendment. That is correct, uh, and it's subject to civil and or criminal pro uh, complaint. And speaking of civil complaints, was the Department of Justice wrong when it brought and won the civil RICO action against the tobacco industry? Well, Senator, they won those cases. They took them to court and eventually uh, won a monumental victory. Uh, that is correct. And it's Hard to say part of the wrong. law and, and uh, firmly established. Hard to say they were wrong if they won, right? That's correct. Um, as you know, the United States has retaliated against Russia for its interference with the 2016 elections in Europe. Baltic states, Germany, and Italy have raised concerns of Russia meddling in their country's elections. I know this has been touched on before, but I want to make sure it's clear. Will the Department of Justice and the FBI under your administration be allowed to continue to investigate the Russian connection, even if it leads to the Trump campaign and Trump interests and associates? And can you assure us that in any conflict between the political interests of the president and the interests of justice, you will follow the interests of justice even if your duties require the investigation and even prosecution of the president, his family, and associates? Well, Senator Whitehouse, uh, if their laws violated and they can be prosecuted, then of course you'll have to handle that in an appropriate way. Uh, I would say that the problem 
may turn out to be, as in the Chinese hacking of our hundreds of thousands of maybe millions of records, uh, has to be handled at a political level. And I do think it's appropriate for a nation who feels that they've been hacked and that information has been improperly used to retaliate uh, against those actions. Um, it's just a... Uh, and I know we and, share a common interest in advancing the cybersecurity of this nation, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on that. Let me ask you a, a factual question. During the course of this boisterous political campaign, did you ever chant, lock her up? No, I did not. I don't think. I heard it <laughs> in uh, rallies and so forth, sometimes I think humorously done, but it was a, a matter that uh, I, I have said a, a few things, a, lot, a special prosecutor, I, I favored that. I think that probably is a, one of the reasons I believe that I should not uh, make any decision about any such case. And you understand that the good guy lawman in the movies is the one who sits on the jailhouse porch and doesn't let the mob in. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm from Rhode Island, as you know, Senator. We have uh, NAACP and ACLU members who've heard you call their organization, who've heard that you called their organizations un-American. We have uh, a vibrant Dominican community who look at Big Poppy. David Ortiz swinging his bat for the Red Sox and wonder why you said, quote, almost no one coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States is coming here because they have a provable skill that would benefit us. I represent a lot of Latinos who worry about modern day Palmer raids breaking up parents from their kids and Muslims who worry about so-called patrols of Muslim homes and neighborhoods. And I've heard from police chiefs who worry that you as attorney general will disrupt law enforcement priorities that they have set out and disrupt the community relations that they have worked hard over years of community engagement to achieve. Um, time is short, but I noticed that in your prepared remarks, these are not unforeseeable concerns, and your prepared remarks did very little to allay the concerns of those people. Is there anything you'd like to add now in our closing minute? Well, thank you. The, um, my comment about the NAACP uh, arose from a discussion that I had uh, where I s expressed concern about their statements that were favoring, uh, I, as I saw it, um, Sandinista efforts and communist guerrilla efforts uh, in Central America. And so I said they could be perceived as un-American and weaken their moral authority to achieve the great things they had been accomplishing uh, in integration and moving forward for reconciliation throughout the country. And I believe that uh, cl clearly. Uh, and I never said and accused them of that. Number two, um, so what would you with regard to of the NAACP in Rhode Island right now? He's the head of the NAACP. So well, I would say, please look at what I've said about that and how that came about. And it was not in that context. It was not correct. I said in 1986 that NAACP represents one of the greatest forces for uh, reconciliation and racial advancement of any entity in the country, probably number one. That's what I said then, I believed it, and I believe it now, uh, and it's an organization that has done tremendous good uh, for us. Uh, with regard to uh, the Dominican Republic, I had gone on a co Codell with uh, Senator Specter. We came through the Dominican Republic. Uh, we visited uh, public service housing projects that seemed to be working and did other things of that nature, and I went and spent some time with the consular official there just to ask him about things. And what I learned was that there's a good bit of fraud in it, and he was somewhat discouraged in his ability to, he felt, to do his job. And we also understood and discussed that the immigration flow is not on a basis of skills. The immigration flow from almost all of our countries, frankly, is based on a family connection and other visas rather than a skilled-based program more like Canada has today. And that's all I intended to be saying there. I, I, it's, uh, tell anybody that heard that statement, 
please don't see that as a diminishment or a uh, uh, criticism of the people of the Dominican Republic. It was designed to just discuss in my remarks the uh, reality of our immigration system today. I'd like to see it more skill-based, and I think that would be helpful. Mr. Chairman, my time's expired. Thank you for your thank, patience. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Before I go to Senator Lee, there's an evaluation of the work of Senator Sessions uh, during his time as U.S. Attorney that I speak, uh, think speaks to his outstanding record. I'm made aware of this because Senator Feinstein requested an evaluation of Senator Sessions' office from the Department of Justice, and I note uh, just a few points from their evaluation uh, back in 1992, a couple of short sentences. All members of the judiciary praised the U.S. Attorney for his advocacy skills, integrity, leadership of the office, and accessibility. And the second quote, the, uh, the USAO for the Southern District of Alabama is an excellent office with outstanding leadership, personnel, and morale. The district is representing the United States in a most capable and professional manner. I, uh, without objection, will put that in the record. Senator Lee. Mr. Chairman, yeah. while we're putting things into the record, could I join? And yes, please do that. consent that a December 5, 2016 letter from leaders of the U.S. environmental movement and a January 5, 2017 letter from the National Task Force to End Sexual Violence and Domestic Violence Against Women be added to the record. Yes, and uh, those will be included without objection. Senator Lee. <clears throat> Hello, Senator Sessions. Hello. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you over the last six years uh, and always found you to be someone who treats colleagues, uh, regardless of differing viewpoints, with dignity and respect. Um, you've taught me a great deal in the six years I've been here, and I've appreciated the opportunity to work with you. I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that we're both lawyers, although being a lawyer around here, uh, certainly having a law degree is not unusual. Um, one of the things that sets you apart and makes you different, I get the sense from you that you think of yourself not so much as a senator who used to be a lawyer, but as a lawyer who is currently serving as a senator. And I think that's an important thing, especially for someone who's been named uh, to be the next Attorney General of the United States. Uh, even though you and I have never had the opportunity to discuss the intricacies of the rule against perpetuities or the difference between the doctrine of worthier title and the rule in Shelley's case, I get the sense that you would eagerly uh, 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 engage in such banter uh, when occasion arises. So maybe in a subsequent round we'll have the opportunity to do that. But this does raise a, a, a discussion that I'd like to have with you about the role of the lawyer. As you know, a, a, a lawyer understands who his or her client is. Anytime you are acting as a lawyer, you, you've got a client. This is a simple thing if you're representing an individual, because in almost every instance, uh, unless the client is incapacitated, you know who the client is. The client has one mouthpiece, one voice, and you know what the interests of that client are, and you can evaluate those based on the interests expressed by the client. It gets a little more complicated when you're representing a corporate entity. Um, typically, you'll interact either with a general counsel or with a chief executive officer. The bigger an entity gets, the more complex it gets. Uh, there might be some ripples in this relationship between the lawyer and the client. In the case of the U.S. government uh, and the attorney general's uh, representation of that client, this is a particularly big uh, and powerful client. And that client has many interests. In a sense, the, the, the client is, of course, the United States of America, but at the same time, the Attorney General is there put in place by the President of the United States and serves at the pleasure of the President of the United States. And so, uh, in that respect, the Attorney General has several interests to balance and must, at, at once, re regard him or herself as a member of the President's Cabinet, uh, re remembering uh, how the Attorney General got there and can be removed at any moment by the President. And at the same time, uh, the Attorney General has the obligation to be independent, to provide an independent source of analysis uh, for the President and for the President's team and Cabinet. H how do you understand these things as a former U.S. Attorney, uh, as a former line prosecutor, and as a Senator who served on the Judiciary Committee? You've had a lot of opportunities to observe this process. 
How, how do you see the proper balancing between all these interests uh, 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 from the standpoint of the Attorney General? That's a very um, in insightful or probing question, and it touches on a lot of the important issues that we, as Attorney General, would, would need to deal with. There are even sometimes these government agencies are like foreign countries. They negotiate memorandums of understanding that are akin to a treaty, actually. Uh, they can't seem to work together oftentimes in an effective way. And so the Attorney General is required to provide opinions on that. The Attorney General uh, ultimately owes his loyalty uh, to the integrity of the American people and to the fidelity to the Constitution and the legitimate laws of the country. That's what he's ultimately required to do. However, every Attorney General um, that has been appointed by a president or they wouldn't become Attorney General, and they've been confirmed by the Senate or they wouldn't be made Attorney General. And so uh, they do understand, I think, that if a president wants to accomplish a goal that he or she believes in deeply, then you should help them do it in a lawful way, but make clear and object if it's an unlawful action. Uh, that helps the president avoid difficulty. It's the ultimate loyalty to him. And you hope that a president, uh, and I hope uh, Pre Tr President-elect Trump has confidence in me so that if I give him advice that something can be done and, or can't be done, that he would respect that. Uh, that's an important relationship, too. But ultimately, uh, you are bound by the laws of the country. Some of that, I assume, could come into play when you're dealing with a politically sensitive case, with a case that is politically sensitive because it relates uh, uh, to a member of the administration uh, or, or to the interplay between the executive branch and the legislative branch, for example. In some of those instances, there can be calls for a special prosecutor. Uh, on the one hand, this is a way of uh, uh, taking the attorney general out of the equation uh, so that it can be handled uh, in a manner that reflects a degree of separation uh, between the administration and, um, and, and the case. On the other hand, there are constitutional questions that are sometimes raised, and sometimes people argue that this places too much of a presumption that the special prosecutor will seek an indictment uh, in order to justify the expense and the time put into appointing a special prosecutor. For reasons that relate to the complexity of these uh, considerations, there are, of course, guidelines in place uh, that can help guide the determination uh, to be made by the Attorney General as to when, whether, how to put in place a special prosecutor. But even within these guidelines, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of discretion in the hands of the Attorney General in deciding how to do that. Do you have anything you, uh, uh, that you would follow? Any, uh, what can you tell us about what considerations you would, uh, uh, would consider in deciding whether or not to appoint a special prosecutor? Well, it is a, um, not a little matter. It is a matter that's created controversy over the years. I don't think it's appropriate for the Attorney General just to willy-nilly create special prosecutors. Uh, history has not shown that has always been a smart thing to do. But there are times when objectivity is required and the absolute appearance of objectivity is required and uh, perhaps a special prosecutor is um, appropriate. It, the Attorney General Lynch, for example, did not appoint a special prosecutor on the Clinton matter. And I did criticize that. I was a politician. We had a campaign on. I didn't research the law in depth. It was just a reaction as a senator of a concern. Uh, but there are, should be, uh, great care should be taken in uh, deciding how to make the appointment or if an appointment of a special prosecutor is required. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, you're not required um, to uh, be a judge, to be a prosecutor. One judge said there's nothing wrong with a prosecutor who likes his work. Uh, and doesn't think laws should be violated. That's, that's, is that a bias? I don't think so. I think that's a strength. So I just would say that's kind of the way, uh, the best I could give you at this point, General Lee. Thank you. No, that's helpful. That, um, another challenging issue that relates to this duty of independence 
um, that attorneys general have um, relates to the Office of Legal Counsel. Uh, the, you know, it's of course the, the, the job of the Office of Legal Counsel, or OLC as it's sometimes known, to issue opinions within the executive branch on a wide array of subjects. Um, some are subjects that a lot of people would find interesting. Uh, others are subjects that only a lawyer could love, uh, and sometimes only a lawyer specializing in something esoteric or specific. There's one, one recent OLC opinion entitled Competitive Bidding Requirements Under the Federal, aid, uh, under the, uh, federal Highway Aid Program. Uh, there aren't perhaps that many people who would find that interesting, but there are a lot of others that would capture immediately the public's interest. What's significant about, about all of these, though, no matter how broad or narrow the topic, no matter how uh, politically uh, sexy or dull the topic might be, they in many instances almost conclusively resolve a legal question within the executive branch of government. And in many instances, they're doing so on the basis of constitutional determinations that may or may not ever be litigated, such that the broaching of a constitutional topic might be opened, studied, and resolved entirely within the executive branch, largely as a result of how the lawyers within the Office of Legal Counsel decide to do their jobs. What, what can you tell me about what you would w do if confirmed to ensure that the Office of Legal Counsel maintains a degree of professionalism and independent, independence uh, 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 requisite for this task? Senator Lee, that office is important. Uh, it does um, adjudicate or actually opine on important issues related to uh, conflicts or disputes within uh, the great executive branch of the American government. Like you said, uh, what, what, what kind of competition is required before you get a highway grant? There may be a disagreement about that, and they, uh, OLC is asked to review it and, and state a, a one position that the government of the United States is one. It's not a multiple government. These departments are not independent agencies. And so uh, that, does for, that office is so exceedingly important, as you indicate, because uh, many times those opinions hold, and they set policy and they affect uh, things. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, it also has the power, uh, and I'm sure you would be sensitive to, to uh, expand or constrict uh, the bureaucracies in their ability to execute uh, under statutes. In other words, is this within their power or is it not within their power? So there's some of the things like that that uh, can impact the American people over time in a significant way. Senator Thank you. Colbert. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you, Thank Senator you. Sessions. Uh, you and I have worked together on a number of bills, uh, including leading the International Adoption Simplification Act, which I believe made a big difference to a lot of families in keeping their siblings together when they were adopted. Um, Senator Cornyn and I led the sex trafficking bill that passed last year, and you had some important provisions in that. And then we've worked uh, together on law enforcement issues, and I appreciate uh, your respect and the support that you have from that uh, community. And I also thank you for your work on drug courts, uh, something we both share as former prosecutors and uh, believe in the purpose of those courts. Uh, but I wanted to lead first with another part of the Justice Department's jobs, and that's uh, protecting uh, civil rights and the right to vote. Uh, my state uh, has the highest voter turnout in the last election of any state. We're pretty proud of that. Um, and as county attorney for eight years for Minnesota's biggest county, I played a major role in making sure that the election laws were enforced um, and that people who were able to vote could vote and that people who shouldn't vote didn't vote. Um, since the Voting Rights Act became law more than 50 years ago, we've made progress, but I've been very concerned about some of the movements by states to restrict access to voting in recent years. We haven't been able to pass the Bipartisan Voting Rights Advancement Act uh, forward uh, last Congress, um, and I just think it's an area that's going to be ripe for a lot of work going forward. You and I talked about how, at one point, you previously called the Voting Rights Act an intrusive piece of legislation. Um, and I wondered if you could explain that, as well as uh, talk about uh, how you will actively enforce uh, the remaining pieces of the act. That would be uh, Section 2, which prohibits voting practices or procedures that discriminate on the basis of race, and the Section 3, 
uh, bail-in provision uh, through which most states can be subject to preclearance. And you don't have to go into great detail on those two sections. You could do it later. But if you could just explain your views of, of the Voting Rights Act moving forward and what would happen in terms of enforcement uh, if you were Attorney General. The Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 was one of the most important acts uh, uh, to deal with racial difficulties uh, that we, we face. And it changed the whole course of history, particularly in the South. There was a clear finding that there was discriminatory activities in the South, that uh, a number of states were systematically uh, denying individuals the right to vote. And you go back into the history, you can see it plainly. Actions and rules and procedures were adopted in a, a number of states with the specific purpose of blocking African Americans uh, from voting. And it was just wrong. And the Voting Rights Act confronted that. And it, in effect, targeted certain states and required any, even the most minor changes in voting procedure, right. like moving a precinct across. So how would, you, how would you approach this going forward? For instance, the Fifth Circuit's decision that the Texas voter ID law discriminates against minority voters. That was written by uh, a Bush appointee. Uh, do you agree with that decision? How would you handle this moving forward? Well, I have not studied that. Um, th there's going to be a debate about it. Courts are ruling on it now and that is a voter ID, and whether or not that is a uh, improper restriction on voting uh, that uh, adversely impacts disproportionately minority citizens. So that's a matter that's got to be decided. On the surface of it, it doesn't appear to me to be that. I have publicly said I think voter ID laws properly drafted are okay, but as Attorney General, it'll be my duty to study the facts in more depth to analyze the law, uh, but fundamentally that can be decided by Congress and the courts as they interpret the existing law. I did vote to extend the uh, Voting Rights Act several years ago. I thought it, and it included Section 5, uh, but later Section 5 was eliminated by the Supreme Court. Uh, on the and basis the that progress had been made. And, this, and on an intrusive question, let me answer that. It yeah. is intrusive. The Supreme Court on more than one occasion has described it legally as an intrusive act because it only focused on a certain number of states. And normally when Congress passes a law, it applies to the whole country. So it's a very unusual thing for a law to be passed that targets only a few states. But they had a factual basis. They were able to show that it was justified in this fashion. Uh, so that's the foundation for it, and that's why I supported it, its renewal. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll understand as uh, you look at this issue um, that there are many voters, people who are trying to vote, that view some of these rules that are put in place as intrusive for them because it makes it harder for them to vote. And I think that is the balance uh, that you're going to need to I hear strike. You and I just, I hope, I just, coming from a state that has such high voter turnout that has same-day registration, uh, very good turnout in Iowa as well, right below us, states that have put in place some really expansive voter laws, and it doesn't mean Democrats always get elected. We've had Republican governors in Minnesota, we have a Republican governor in Iowa, and I just point out that I think the more we can do to encourage people to vote, the better democracy we have. And I wanna turn to another quick question on a democratic issue as in a democracy issue that was raised by Senator Graham and um, as Senator Whitehouse, I just returned with Senators McCain and Graham uh, from a trip to Ukraine, Baltics, Georgia, and uh, learned there about how these intrusive cyber attacks are not just unique to our country, not just unique to one party, not just unique um, to one election, and they've seen that movie before in those countries. And do you have any reason to doubt the accuracy of the conclusion reached by our 17 intelligence agencies uh, that, in fact, Russia used cyber attacks to attempt to influence uh, this last election? I'm not asking if you believe that influenced it, just if you believe the report of our intelligence agencies. I have no reason to doubt that and have no evidence that would indicate otherwise. Thank you. Um, Violence Against Women Act, Senator Leahy asked some of those questions, really important to me. You and I discussed it. I just have one question there. If confirmed, will you continue to support uh, the life-saving work being done by the Office on Violence Against Women? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, immigration, you and I have some different views on this, um, and I often focus on the economic benefits of immigration, uh, the fact that we have 70 of our Fortune 500 companies headed by immigrants. At one point, 200 of our Fortune 500 companies uh, were uh, either formed by immigrants or kids of immigrants. Roughly 25% of all U.S. Nobel laureates were foreign born. Um, and just to uh, understand, in a state like mine, where we have entry level workers in dairies are immigrants, uh, major doctors at the Mayo Clinic, police officers who are Somali, if you see that economic benefit of immigrants uh, in our society. Well, immigration has been a high priority for the United States. We've been a leading country in the world in accepting immigration. I don't think American people want to end immigration. I do think that if you bring in a larger flow of labor than we have jobs for, it does impact adversely uh, the wage prospects and the job prospects of American citizens. I think as a nation we should evaluate immigration on whether or not it serves and advances the national interest, not the corporate interest. Uh, it has to be the people's interest first. And I do think too often we've, uh, uh, Congress has been compli complacent uh, in uh, supporting legislation that might make businesses happy, uh, but it also may have had the impact of pulling wages down. Dr. Borjas at Harvard has uh, written about that. I think he's the world's perhaps most uh, effective and knowledgeable scholar, and he says that does happen. Wages can be diminished, and one of the big cultural problems we have today is middle class and lower class Americans have not, lower class economically, are not having the wage increases that we'd like to see them have. In fact, since 2000, wages are still down from what they were in 2000. Mm -hmm. I just see that we can do a mix of um, making sure that we have jobs for people here and then understanding that we're a country of immigrants. Um, On that subject, I, uh, you're familiar with Canada. Hmm? We okay. um, and we are people of America. You have not gone against American legislation that would keep my family together. You are isolated, you are supported by hate groups that are not being trying to push racist legislation. You are not a good attorney general. Mr. Chairman, if I could just have another 30 seconds here. I had one, one last question. Maybe 45 seconds. Mr. Chairman, I would just say that yeah. you come up close to the Canadian system. I think may uh, be some of those policies ought to be considered by the United States. Uh, my last question, Mr. Chairman, is on the uh, reporter's issue. Uh, free press, I believe, is essential to our democracy. Um, and I've always fought to ensure that those rights aren't compromised. My dad uh, was a reporter, a newspaper reporter for years, um, and I'm especially sensitive to the role of the press as a watchdog. Um, you've raised concerns in the past about protecting journalists uh, from uh, revealing their sources. Um, you did not support the Free Flow of Information Act. In 2015, um, attor the Attorney General revised the Justice Department rules for when federal prosecutors can subpoena journalists or their records. Um, and he also committed to releasing an annual report on any subpoenas issues or charges made against journalists and committed not to put reporters in jail for doing their job. Um, if confirmed, will you commit to following the standards already in place at the Justice Department? And will you make that commitment uh, not to put reporters in jail for doing their jobs? Senator Klobuchar, I'm not sure. I have not studied that, uh, uh, those regulations. I would note that when I was United States Attorney, um, we knew, everybody knew, that you could not subpoena uh, a witness or, or, or push them to be interviewed if they were a member of the media without approval at high levels of the Department of Justice. That was in the 1980s. And so I do believe the Department of Justice does have sensitivity to this issue. There have been a few examples of where the press and, and the Department of Justice haven't agreed on these issues, but for the most part, there is a broadly recognized and proper deference to the news media. But you could have a situation in which uh, a media is really not the unbiased media we see today, and they could be a, a mechanism through which uh, uh, unlawful intelligence is obtained. There are other dangers that, that 
could happen with regard to the federal government that normally doesn't happen to the media uh, co covering murder cases in, in the states. All right. Well, thank you. And I'll follow up with that in a written question when you have a chance to look if at If you those. would, I would. Thank you. Thank you. I call for the first time on a new member of the committee, Senator Sass from Nebraska. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to enter into the record a letter of support from 25 current state attorneys general, including Doug Peterson, the attorney general from my state of Nebraska. The letter reads in part, no one is more qualified to fill this role than Senator Sessions. Uh, this is obviously important testimony from the top law enforcement officers of 25 states. I ask unanimous consent, uh, Mr. Chairman, to include this in the record. Without objection, it will be included. Proceed, thank Senator Sass. Thank you. Uh, Senator Sessions, when you were introducing your grandkids, uh, and I'm amazed that they stayed around as long as they did, mine would have been more disruptive earlier. Um, I was thinking about all the time I spend in schools, and uh, we have a crisis in this country um, of civic ignorance. Our kids don't know basic civics, and we have a crisis of public trust in this country in that many Americans presume that people in the city are overwhelmingly motivated by uh, partisan perspectives rather than the public good. Tragically, um, our current president multiple times over the last three or four years has exacerbated this political polarization by saying that he didn't have legal authority to do things and then subsequently doing exactly those things. Quite apart uh, from people's policy perspectives on these matters, this is a crisis when kids don't understand the distinction between the legislative and the executive branches and when American voters don't think that people who serve in these offices take their oaths seriously. So it's not always as simple as uh, schoolhouse rock jingles on Saturday morning, but could you at least start by telling us what you think the place for executive orders and executive actions are? That's a good question and a good premise that we should think about. Uh, People are taught the um, schoolhouse rock is uh, not a bad basic lesson in how the government's supposed to work. Legislators pass laws, uh, the Congress, or the president executes laws, as does the entire administration, as passed by Congress or follows the Constitution, and the judicial branch uh, decides disputes as a neutral umpire, an unbiased un, uh, participant of any of the sides of the controversy and does it objectively. So I think every day that we get away from that is really dangerous. And it is true that if a president says, I do not have this authority, and other people say the president do, does not have certain authority, and then it is done by the president, it confuses people. And it's, um, I think, colleagues, we too little appreciate something that's corrosive happening out in our country. There is a feeling that judges just vote when they get a big case before them on what their political agenda is and not what the Constitution actually requires. That judges can redefine the meaning of words to advance an agenda that they have that may not be the agenda of the American people. And that inevitably is corrosive to respect for law. Thank you. Um, but take it one step further, because there are going to be many cases, there will be many instances where the administration in which you are likely going to end up serving will want to do things, and they'll want to know what the limits of their executive discretion is. Pieces of legislation that have been passed around here in recent years sometimes are you know, well over a thousand pages with all sorts of clauses, the secretary shall dot, 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 fill in the law. So this Congress has regularly underreached and invited executive overreach. This Congress has regularly failed to finish writing laws and then invited the executive branch to do it. What are some of the markers that you would use to help understand the limits where the executive branch cannot go? We really need to get, um, reestablish that. Professor Turley, Jonathan Turley, has written about this. It's just powerful. He's certainly an objective voice in American jurisprudence, and he says that Congress has just uh, fallen down on its job. Now, of course, there are two ways. One of them is that it writes laws that are too broad. And I would urge all of you to be sure that when we pass a law, or you pass a law, if I'm confirmed, that that law is clear and sets limits. When it doesn't set limits, then you can have the secretary of this agency or that agency claiming they have certain authorities, and you end up with a very muddled litigation maybe resulting from it. So reestablishing the proper separation of powers and fidelity to law 
and to limits is an important issue. And I think, hopefully, I think that's what you're suggesting. Could you tell me under what circumstances, if any, you think the Department of Justice can fail to enforce a law? Well, it can fail to enforce it uh, by setting in prosecutorial policies with regard to uh, declining to prosecute whole chunks of cases and, in fact, uh, eliminate a statute. If a, a new tax is passed and the Department of Justice uh, says it can't be collected, then the law is not followed. Uh, you also have the circumstances in which can uh, redefine the statute or, or alter, if we're talking about improper actions, it could expand the meaning of the words of the statute far beyond what Congress ever intended. And, and, not, and that's an abuse too. Not, not to interrupt you too soon, but um, the improper, but also what is proper? Because this administration has made the case regularly um, that they need to exercise prosecutorial discretion because of limited resources. And obviously there aren't infinite resources in the world. So what are some proper instances in your view when an administration might not enforce a law? Well, critics uh, of the um, immigration enforcement, the DAPA and the DACA laws, uh, said that the prosecutorial discretion argument went too far. It basically just eliminated the laws from the books. Secondly, with regard to that, uh, the president's executive, uh, well, the order came from Homeland Security, not from the Department of Justice, but uh, Homeland Security's order not only said we're not going to force the law with regard to certain large classifications of people, but those people who had not been given legal status under the laws of the United States were given photo IDs, work authorization, and Social Security numbers, and the right to participate in these government programs that would appear to be contrary to uh, uh, existing law. So that would, me, to me, suggest an overreach. And uh, in parallel, before the courts, what instances would it be legitimate, if any, uh, for the Solicitor General to not defend a law in court? That is a very good question, I and mean, sometimes it becomes a real matter. In general, the Solicitor General, um, as part of the Department of Justice uh, and the executive branch, uh, states the uh, position of the Department of Justice. And it has a duty, the Department of Justice does, to defend the laws passed by this body, by Congress. And they should be defended vigorously, whether or not the Solicitor General agrees with them or not, unless it can't be reasonably defended. And so sometimes you reach a disagreement about whether it's reasonably defensible or not. But that's the fundamental question. And uh, uh, the Department of Justice should defend laws that Congress passed unless it's, uh, uh, they're unable to do so in a reasonable way. What is the place of independent agencies in a unified executive branch? And do you envision that you will make, be making any recommendations to the president uh, to rein in independent agencies in an effort to preserve the constitutional distinction between the powers of the Congress and the administrative responsibilities of an executive branch? Senator, it's a good question, a kind of a historic question at this point in time, because it does appear to me that agencies oftentimes uh, see themselves as independent fiefdoms. Uh, and sometimes you even hear the president complain about things clearly under his control. Uh, I remember President Clinton complaining about the death penalty processes uh, in, of the Department of, of um, Federal Government when he appointed the Attorney General, who had just appointed a committee to make sure the death penalty was properly carried out. So, I mean, like, whose responsibility is this? Uh, you're in charge. Of, you can remove the Attorney General if you're not happy. So those kind of things do continue out there that we need to be careful about. Um, and I thank you for raising it. Uh, I have less than a minute left. So uh, last question, but going back to something that Senator Lee was asking about, could you just give a top-line summary of what you view the responsibilities of the OLC to be and what the relationship would be between the OLC, the Office of the Attorney General, and the White House? Well, OLC has statutory duties to make opinions. Um, the OLC team reports to the Attorney General, who could reverse, I suppose, or remove the OLC uh, 
head, the deputy attorney general, uh, if he thought those, that department was not following the law. But essentially, they are given the power. As, as attorney general, I had an opinions uh, section in Alabama, and they rendered opinions uh, on a whole host of matters when called upon from school boards and uh, highway departments and that sort of thing. So this OLC does represent a key position in the Department of Justice. They must have extraordinary legal skill. They uh, have to be terrific lawyers. They have to understand the constitutional order of which we are a part, and they should render objective decisions uh, day after day, week after week. Uh, it, ultimately, the responsibility of the, pre of the president and the attorney general to ensure that we have that kind of quality at OLC. Thank you. Senator Franken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator, congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. In 2009, when you became the ranking Republican on this committee, you were interviewed about how you would approach the committee's work and nominations specifically. You said that Democrats should expect you to be fair because you had been through this process yourself back in 1986 and you felt that back then the committee had distorted your record. You said that moving forward, quote, we're not going to misrepresent any nominee's record and we're not gonna lie about it, unquote. And we certainly don't want to do that uh, to our colleague. But I also think it's fair to expect that sitting before us today that you're not going to misrepresent your own record. That's fair to say, right? That is fair. Good. Now, in that same interview, you said, quote, I filed 20 or 30 civil rights cases to desegregate schools and political organizations and county commissions when I was the United States Attorney. So 20 or 30 desegregation cases. Did I misread that quote? I believe that's what I've been quoted as saying. And I suspect okay. I said that. Okay, now that was 2009. But in November, of this. Your, your office said, quote, when Senator Sessions was U.S. attorney, he filed a number of desegregation lawsuits in Alabama, not 20 or 30 this time, but a number. So tell me, did you file 20 or 30 desegregation cases, or is it some other number? Well, thank you, Senator Frank, and it is important for us to be accurate. Uh, the records don't show that there were 20 or 30 actually filed cases. Some of the cases involve multiple defendants and multiple parties, like to a, a school board and a county commission being sued for racial discrimination or uh, things of that nature. But the number would be less than that, as we've uh, looked at. So, I, what, what do you think would have caused you to say? I don't that know. You I filed thought... 20 or 30 desegregation. <laughs> well, we had cases going throughout my district, and some of them. Uh, were started before I came and continued after I left. Uh, some of them uh, were brought and then settled promptly. And uh, so it was extraordinarily difficult, actually, and I was surprised to get a record by checking the docket sheets to find out exactly how many cases were in, okay. involved. I heard one lawyer from the Department of Justice no, agreed uh, with let that me move on. large number, and, but I don't, the record doesn't justify it. The questionnaire you submitted for today asks you to list and describe the quote, 10 most significant litigated matters you personally handled. Personally handled. And among the case, you, cases that you listed that you personally handled are three voting rights cases and a desegregation case. Last week, I should note three attorneys who worked at DOJ and who actually brought three of the four cases uh, wrote an op-ed piece in which they say, quote, we can state categorically that Sessions had no substantive involvement in any of them. 
Now, you originally said that you personally handled three of these cases, but these lawyers say that you had no substantive involvement. Uh, Cha Chairman Grassley, I would ask that the, that op-ed from last Tuesday's Washington Post be entered into the record. Uh, without objection, it will be entered. Are they distorting your record here? Yes. Uh, in fact, one of the writers there, Mr. Hebert, well, spent a good bit of time in my office. Uh, he said I supported him in all the cases he brought, that I was more supportive than almost any other U.S. attorney, and that I provided office space, I signed the complaints that he brought. And as you know, um, may know, uh, Senator Franken, uh, when a lawyer signs a complaint, uh, he's required to affirm that he believes in that complaint and supports that complaint and supports that legal action, which I did. We sued. So that's your, that's your personal involvement? Was that your name was on it? Well, look, uh, you can dispute the, the impact or the import of the questionnaire. Another attorney, who uh, Paul Hancock, who brought cases in our district, said, well, the Attorney General claims credit for the cases in the Department of Justice. He saw nothing wrong with my claiming that this was a case that I had handled. Okay, two of uh, the... So you can disagree with that, but okay. those I want to get through this, and I don't want you to... On the, on, I, I want to get through on this. On the docket sheet, my name is listed number one on the, uh, as okay, the attorney well, for the case. I'm not a lawyer. I'm one of the few members of this committee who didn't go to law school, and usually I get by just fine, but it seems to me that a lawyer if a lawyer has just his name added to a document here or a filing there, uh, that lawyer would be misrepresenting his record if he said he was per personally handled these cases. Two of the lawyers who wrote the op-ed have also submitted testimony for today's hearing, Mr. Jerry Hebert and Mr. Joe Rich. Mr. Hebert says, quote, uh, litigated, uh, it says he, quote, litigated personally two of the four cases you listed. He said, I can state with absolute certainty that Mr. Sessions did not participate personally in either. Mr. Rich worked on one of the four cases you listed. He said, quote, I never met him at that time nor any other time, and he had no input to the case. These represent three of the four cases that you claimed that were among the top ten cases that you personally handled. Now, in your 1986 questionnaire, you fra use phrases like, quote, I prepared and tried the case as sole counsel, and quote, I was the lead prosecutor on this case, assisted by so-and-so. Why didn't you use the same level of detail in your 2016 questionnaire? And looking at this questionnaire, uh, we decided that, that was an appropriate response since uh, it was a major historic cases in my office. Let me just reply, Senator Frank, in, in, in this fashion. Mr. Hebert, uh, when, in 1986, when he testified at my hearing, said, quote, we have had difficulty with several U.S. attorneys in cases we have wanted to bring. We have not experienced that difficulty in the cases I have handled with Mr. Sessions. In fact, quite the contrary, close quote. He goes on to say, I've had occasion numerous times to ask for his assistance and guidance. I have been able to go to him, and he has had an open-door policy. And I have taken advantage of that and found him cooperative. And that is an accurate statement. I don't know Mr. Rich. Uh, perhaps he handled a case that I never worked with. He goes on to say, well, One of the cases No, I want to raise this question. Senator one of the Franklin. cases that you listed was a case that Mr. Rich handled. So if you don't know him, it's hard for me to believe that you personally handled it. Well, when I found that uh, these cases, I, I had been supportive you of it. Sure, I was. Uh, Mr. Hebert says, quote, and yet I have needed Mr. Hel Sessions' help in those cases, and he has provided that help every step of the way. 
In fact, I would say that my experience with Mr. Sessions has led me to believe that I have received more cooperation uh, uh, from him, more active involvement from him, because I have called upon him, close quote. Quote, I have worked side by side with him on some cases in the sense that I have had to go to him for some advice, close quote. In some cases. Uh, We're not necessarily the ones you listed. Well, look, okay, this listen, was 30 we're... years ago, and I, I, my memory uh, was of this nature, and my memory was my support for those cases. Your memory. Okay. Look, I am not, I'm one of the few members of this committee who's not a lawyer. The chairman and the ranking aren't. But when I hear I filed a case, you know, I, I, I don't know some of the parlance, it might have a special meaning in legal parlance, but to me, as a layman, it sounds to me like filed means I led the case or I supervised the case. It doesn't mean that my name was on it. And it seems to me, look, I, I'll close, Mr. Chairman. Setting aside any political or ideological differences that you or may, I may have, DOJ is facing real challenges, whether it's protecting civil rights or defending national security. And our country needs an attorney general who doesn't misrepresent or inflate their level of involvement on any given issue. I hear So you. I consider this serious stuff. As I know that you would if you were in my position. Well, you are correct, Senator Franken. We need to be accurate in what we say. Uh, when this issue was uh, raised, I did do a supplemental that said I provided assistance and guidance to civil rights division attorneys, had an open door policy with them, and cooperated with them on these cases. Close quote. I signed them, I supported cases and uh, attempted to be as effective as I could be in helping them be successful in these historic cases. I did feel that they uh, were the kind of cases that were national in scope and deserved to be listed on the form. If I'm in error, I apologize to you. I don't think I was. Well, well you, did, you couldn't find 20 or 30 desegregation cases that you stated you had participated in and you it don't sound like you personally handled cases that you said you personally Well, I was on a Thank you. radio interview without any records, and that was my memory at the time. I think you Thank answered you. the question. Uh, Senator Flake, uh, now it's uh, tw uh, 12.59, so at 2.09, we will adjourn for lunch. I'll be back here then at uh, 2.39, and whoever's present will start then, but I hope everybody can be back here at least by 2.45. Or, well, you, whatever, I, I got the, uh, is, uh, you, you, you know what I mean. Go ahead, Senator. Please. Well, thank you. Wait, are you saying we're adjourned or I'm going? Oh, you go ahead. Okay, all right. <laughs> Great. It's always be the la nice being the last one standing between lunch. Uh, let's, have, uh, let's, let, let, let's have order for Senator Flake. <laughs> Hey, I just want to say at the outset uh, how much I've enjoyed working with you and being your colleague. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, having you as a friend. Uh, it's no secret we've had our difference of opinion on immigration legislation that uh, we put forward. You've had different ideas, but I have no doubt that uh, as Attorney General, you'll faithfully execute the office. I'm sorry. And I appreciate uh, the answers that you've given today. Let me ask unanimous consent to submit uh, uh, a column written by our own Attorney General in Arizona, Mark Burnovich, uh, for the Hill newspaper this week, uh, supporting without, your... Without objection, it'll be included. He's supporting your nomination. Let me talk to you about uh, an aspect of immigration that's important in Arizona. As you know, we have a large border uh, with Mexico. Um, we have a program called Operation Streamline that has, over the years, been tremendously effective in cutting down uh, recidivism in terms of border crossers. Um, what it is, basically, it's intended to reduce border crossing by expeditiously uh, prosecuting those who enter the country illegally over an, under a no tolerance or zero tolerance policy. It's credited with being instrumental in achieving 
better border security, specifically in the Yuma sector along the western side of Arizona's border with Mexico. Nevertheless, in, in recent years, the U.S. Uh, Attorney's Office for the District of Arizona adopted a policy that ended uh, prosecutions for those who cross uh, but for, well, without a criminal history uh, other than simply crossing the border. I've asked Attorney General Holder and uh, Attorney General Lynch, as well as Secretary Johnson at Homeland Security, on what is being done here, and I haven't gotten a straight answer, no, many, no matter how many times I ask the question. So I'm looking forward to a little more candor here. As Attorney General, if you're confirmed, what steps will you take uh, to restore Operation Streamline uh, to a zero-tolerance approach that's been so successful in Arizona? in part of, a portion of Arizona's border. Thank you. Senator Flake, um, I have enjoyed working with you, and um, I know the integrity with which you bring your uh, views on the immigration system. Uh, like you, um, I, be I believe that Streamline was very effective, and I was really surprised that it's been undermined and significantly. Uh, the reports I got initially some years ago, maybe a decade or more ago, was it was dramatically effective. And so I would absolutely review that. And uh, my inclination would, would be, uh, at least uh, at this stage, to think it should be restored and even refined and made sure it's lawful and effective. But uh, I think it has great positive potential to improve legality at the, at the border. All right. Well, thank you. It's been effective in Yuma, and I can tell you there's concern there uh, among the sheriff's office, Sheriff Wilmont, and others. Uh, concern that uh, we're seeing a, an increase in border crossings simply because uh, the cartels understand very well uh, what where there's a zero tolerance policy and where there is not. Word spreads, and we could quickly get to a situation where we have a problem in the Yuma sector like we do in the Tucson sector. Is there any reason why we haven't expanded this program to the Tucson sector if it's been successful elsewhere? I do not know what reason that might be. It seems to me that uh, we should examine the successes and see if they can't be replicated throughout the border. All right, well, thank you. I look forward to working with you on that. I appreciate that opportunity to work with you on that because I've long felt it's the, the right direction for us to go. Thank you. When we have a successful program, it's uh, difficult to see it scrapped um, and to see the progress that's been made in certain parts of the border uh, done away with. Let me uh, get to another subject here. Victims' rights. Uh, this is an area of the law that you've shown particularly interest in over your time as a senator. Um, I have with me letters of support for your nomination from various victims groups and advocates, uh, the victims of crime and leniency. Uh, Verna Watt, Victims of uh, and Friends United, op-ed by Professors uh, Paul Cassell and Steve Twist, all in support of your nomination. I'd ask that these documents be placed as part of the record. As Attorney General, what steps will you take to ensure that victims' rights are protected? We cannot forget victims' rights. We have a um, victim uh, a witness legislation that creates within each United States Attorney's Office, a victim witness coordinator, and the job of that person is to make sure the concerns of the victims are heard, if they have to come to court to help them get there, to make sure that they don't feel threatened and are protected. Uh, that's a direct responsibility of the Department of Justice and the criminal uh, justice system as, as directed by Congress. So I really think that's one step. Uh, and that's the fundamental mechanism, I think, uh, Senator Kyle was a, a strong advocate for that, and it helped really improve uh, uh, the treatment of victims in, in federal criminal cases. There's just no doubt about it. Well, thank you. I was going to note the presence of former Senator Kyle, uh, my predecessor in this office, who did uh, so much work in this area uh, partnering with you. So thank All you for that answer. I'm honored that he's uh, giving of his time to assist me in this effort. Honored very greatly. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about the uh, Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, it was mentioned previously, I think, by Senator Collins. 
As Attorney General, uh, you not only led the Department of Prosecutors and Law Enforcement Officers, but also the Bureau, of, you will lead not only the Department of uh, Prosecutors and Law Enforcement Officials, but also the Bureau of Prisons. You'll be responsible for 190,000 federal inmates currently in custody. This is an often overlooked part uh, of the Attorney General's uh, role, but it's an important part of the position that you're being nominated for. I believe one of the highlights in your record in the Senate is your leadership in passing the Prison Rape Elimination Act of 2003, or PREA, uh, which passed both chambers without objection and was signed into law by George W. Bush. This was a bipartisan bill. Uh, you worked across the aisle with the late Senator Kennedy, as well as with Republican Representative Frank Wolf, Democrat Representative uh, Bobby Scott in the House. And I have uh, letters of support from anti-prison rape activists that I'd also like to put as part of the record, without objection, if I could. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with the law approaching its uh, 15th anniversary, 11 states have certified that they're in compliance with the national standards. Another 41 states and territories have provided assurances that they're working toward compliance. Only four states and territory, territories have chosen not to participate. Uh, is PREA meeting the expectations you had for it when you introduced the, the bill in 2003? I don't think there's any doubt that it's improved the situation. Uh, as to whether it's reached its full potential, I don't think I'm able to tell you with certainty, but I certainly think it's made a positive difference. You know, it was a special time for me. Senator Kennedy was a strong critic of me in 1986. And uh, he said, you know, we were working on this. He said, I've wanted to work with you on legislation like this. And I think it was sort of a reconciliation moment. We also worked on another major uh, piece of legislation for several years. It would have been rather historic, uh, but it was private savings accounts for lower wage workers in America uh, that I guess the financial crisis of 07 or somewhere, some things happened that ended that prospect. But uh, I believe that it's important for American people to know that when an individual is sentenced to prison, they're not subjected to cruel and inhuman punishment under the Constitution at a minimum. And I, the idea that was so widely spread that there's routine uh, sexual abuse and assaults in prisons and other kind of unacceptable activities uh, was widespread in our media and widespread among the American people. One of our goals was to establish just how big it was to require reporting, to uh, and create circumstances that, in th that, that help ensure that a person who should be prosecuted for violence in the prison actually do get prosecuted uh, was a real step forward. We do not need to subject uh, prisoners to any more punishment than the law requires. Thank you. In the just remaining seconds I have, uh, let me just say there's another area that we uh, have worked on and, and hopefully we can continue to work on, and that's the area of duplicative uh, DOJ grants. As you know, the uh, department uh, awarded approximately $17 billion in grants over the years. OIG reports, uh, GAO reports have all shown that there's duplication and waste uh, sometimes fraud and abuse. Uh, we continue to commit to work to uh, root out uh, this kind of duplicative uh, action there. Well, I know you've had a, um, a history of being um, a staunch defender of the Treasury against those who would abuse it, and I believe the same way. It's the taxpayer's money. Every dollar that's extracted from an American citizen that goes into the government needs to get to productive, valuable activities and any of it that's de de delivered for political and insufficient reasons is a cause of great concern. I will make it a priority of mine to make sure that the dollars we have are actually getting to the purposes they're supposed to go for. It's one thing to say, I did a great thing, I got more money for this good purpose, but did it really efficiently and effectively go there? Did it really make a positive difference? So I think the Department of Justice uh, can utilize those grant programs to help valuable uh, activities, and it needs to guard against uh, improper activities. Thank you, Senator Sessions. Thank you, Mr. Uh, we'll break for about 30 minutes. We'll reconvene at 1.40. Senator Coons would be next up, and he's indicated he'll be here on time.
So uh, recess for now.